Atlanta City Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet wishing you and your family happy holidays and a safe and healthy new year. Welcome to Stay at Home Connect. I'm Phyllis Jackson. Georgia sees more than 6,000 COVID cases in a single day, its highest record so far. One in three hospitals are at capacity or approaching it. The Northeast Georgia Health System in Hall County has so many COVID patients, they're having to set up hospital beds in a nearby gym to handle the overflow. An FDA advisory panel votes 17 to 4 to recommend emergency authorization of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for people over the age of 16. Two of the four dissenting votes were over a lack of data on the vaccine's impact on 16 and 17 year olds. Ultimately, the committee decided that the benefits outweighed the risks. Now the CDC votes on whether to recommend the vaccine. Moderna faces the same FDA process next week as it's looking for teenagers between the ages of 12 and 17. They want to sign them up for clinical trials. In a statement, Moderna's CEO says they hope to have enough evidence to support vaccinating this age group before school starts next year. CVS and Walgreens hire thousands of healthcare workers to help inoculate those in long-term care facilities nationwide. In an email to customers, the companies say they're looking for qualified pharmacists, nurses, and pharmacy technicians. The Atlanta City Council announces its committee chairs and appointments for 2021. If you'd like to see the list, visit our website at citycouncil.atlantaga.gov. That's citycouncil.atlantaga.gov. Well, here's a new word for your vocabulary, shipageddon. It's the delay in your holiday gift delivery due to an increase in online shopping and shipments of coronavirus vaccines. Officials from FedEx and UPS say they're working to address the challenge, but add the best way to ensure your packages arrive on time is to ship them early. That's a wrap. We'll see you on the next edition of Stay at Home Connect. The Atlanta City Council approves the City of Atlanta's 2021 legislative package, a rundown of proposals and policies to convey the city's legislative and budget priorities to the Georgia General Assembly during the 2021 legislative session. Among the items, the City of Atlanta's opposition to any legislation or action seeking to change ownership, operations and governance of Hartsville-Jackson Atlanta International Airport including any entity that would provide oversight responsibilities for governance and or operations. The council says yes to an ordinance amending the city's code of ordinances to set up regulations for establishments wanting to operate outdoor dining areas on the street in the public right of way. Those establishments would need to apply to the city of Atlanta's Department of Transportation for a temporary permit through 2021. The council greenlights an ordinance authorizing the city's chief financial officer to make transfers within the coronavirus relief funds provided to the city from the CARES Act to cover costs incurred due to COVID-19 public health related efforts. Legislation is filed authorizing an agreement with Agape Tennis Academy for the management, maintenance and performance of capital improvements at the city's five tennis centers. For more recently approved legislation, please visit our website, citycouncil.atlantaga.gov. This has been your Atlanta City Council Legislative Minute. I'm Phyllis Jackson. Welcome to Stay at Home Connect. President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, tests positive for coronavirus. Medical experts say he could have exposed hundreds of people to the virus while in Atlanta during a recent state Senate hearing at the Capitol. Governor Brian Kemp and Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan issue a joint statement 
saying they will not violate state law for a special session of the General Assembly to name presidential electors and overturn Joe Biden's election win. The Trump campaign made the request. The statement says the move, quote, is not an option allowed under state or federal law. If you're dealing with student loan debt, you have a little more time. The federal student loan payments have been suspended through the end of January. The holiday season brings out the kindness and generosity of so many. But Georgia's Secretary of State warns it could also bring out the worst in those hoping to take advantage. Brad Raffensperger issues a video message explaining how to avoid getting scammed and how to make donations safely. Never, 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 never give your personal financial information over the phone. Donate by credit card or mail a check directly to the charity. Do not give your debit card or bank account information to a phone solicitor. Never make payments to individuals. Officials say you should know exactly where your donation is going and make sure it's really being given to help those in need. And it's okay to ask just how much of the donation will go to the cause itself. To report a scam or fraudulent activity, send an email to charities at sos.ga.gov or call 570-312-2640. That's 570-312-2640. The Elsevier Journal publishes an article highlighting government communication through social media during a pandemic. The city of Atlanta, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco were featured in addition to the way in which they disseminated vital COVID-19 information through its Twitter platforms. In April, the publication collected 10 days worth of data from the city's Twitter accounts and found that the city of Atlanta's response illustrates a whole of government approach to the pandemic. The goal is to provide insight for local government officials and to help accelerate understanding of how these entities and the public handle emergencies, including a crisis involving public health. Atlanta City Council member Marcy Collier Overstreet takes part in a groundbreaking for the truest young family at Promise Center. We want to make sure that every youth knows that they're supported by the city, that the APD and the foundation, the Atlanta Police Foundation, supports them and is rooting for them. And that's what the At Promise Center is all about. It is tailored, individualized programming per youth. And these youth are usually at risk, but not here, they're at promise. That's a wrap on Stay at Home Connect. We'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Council Member J.P. Matsakite, and from our family to your family, I want to wish you a happy holiday season and a wonderful new year.
Good afternoon. Okay. Hi. It's two o'clock, and I was, I'm Council Member Shepherd. We will now officially call the meeting to order for public safety and legal administration for to Monday, December the 14th. Uh, we will start with Ms. Lindo, uh, our analyst. Analyst, can you please uh, do a roll call?
President Moore hears you. Ms. Lindo, are you there? Yes, Madam Chair, the issues have been resolved. It's much clearer. Thank you all for your cooperation. Okay, let's start all over again. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member George Shepard, Chair of Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. We will officially call our meeting to get to together for today, December the 14th, for this committee. Ms. Lindo, can we do a roll call again? Yes, Madam Chair, we have Council Member Dustin Hillis. Present. Council Member Michael Julian Bond. Here. Council Member Paula Smith. Here. Council Member Amir Faroki. Council Member Faroki. Council Member Cleta Winslow. Present. Council Member Andrea Boone. Present. And, Council, and, and Madam Chair, we have Council President Felicia Moore on the link. I'm not sure if Mr. Brown has. Well, thank you, Pat. We do more for being, being here. Is Mr. Faroki on at this point? Mr. Faroki. Can somebody text him and find out if he's having problems get, getting in? Do we have Mr. Brown on? I know he was with us earlier. Y yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Can someone text Mr. Faroki and make sure before we go any farther that he's not having technical difficulty? Yes, Madam Chair, staff is checking. We'll hold for just one moment, guys. We don't have to start all over again. Mr. Faroki is on the line, Madam Chair. Mr. Faroki, you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. So we now officially have a quorum. So again, we will call the meeting to order. Uh, can you go ahead now, Ms. Linda, with the remote meeting statement, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Today's Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee meeting will be conducted remotely as advertised and in accordance with the Georgia Code Section 50-14-1. The meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting conference bridge toll free by dialing 877-579-6743 and entering conference ID number 831-599-1256. This information was also provided on the Friday, December 11th, 2020 public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, the Council's homepage at citycouncil.atlanta.ga.gov, Facebook and Twitter pages at HL Council, and the Council's YouTube channel. All presentations are available on the Atlanta City Council website on the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee presentation space. Today's, pub today's meeting agenda was also published and made available on Friday, December 11th via the City's website at Atlanta cga.iqm2.com. In addition, the public was able to submit comments via voicemail at 404-330-6022 yesterday between the hours of 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. These comments will be played during the public comment portion of this meeting. All persons present on the remote council meeting conference bridge are requested to mute your phones and speakers. Meeting participants wishing to speak must be acknowledged by the committee chair. Amendments, substitute, Presentations and informational documents have been distributed to the committee members beforehand. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We will now move to the adoption of the agenda. Uh, we are just going to add one little small presentation up under, I mean, up under item D for presentation. We will have a brief update on the uh, Atlanta Correction Detention Center by Mr. Justin Johnson, our deputy COO. Other than that, the agenda will be as presented. Uh, we'll, is there a motion to accept the agenda? I'll make the motion. No move, okay, thank you, Mr. Faroki. Is there a second? Winslow, a second. Oh. Okay, thank you, Ms. Winslow. We're ready for the vote. One moment, Madam Chair, the vote is open. 
it's everybody voting other than Miss Winslow via the computer? Or any other folks who have to vote verbally? I'll be a voice vote today, okay. Madam Chair. All right. Ms. All right. So, Mr. Bond, how do you vote? Yay. Thank you. The vote is closed. The news are remains that that agenda has been adopted. Thank you so much. We will now move for the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Linda, we're ready for the vote. One moment, Madam Chair. The vote is open. Ms. Winslow? I'm sorry, Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. And thank you. And Mr. Bond? I was the second. Yay. Oh, sorry. Thank you. The vote's closed, Madam Chair. That's seven years. Zero yay. The meeting minutes have been approved. Thank you. We're now at public comment. I believe we have 20 comments, which equates to about 22 minutes and 41 seconds. Are we ready for public comment, Ms. Lindo? Yes, Madam Chair, one moment. Betty Barnard, I'm a resident of District 2, and I'm calling to voice support for closing the jail and uh, redeveloping the former facility using options developed through extensive public input led by women on the rise. Um, I'm also calling to express concern about APD's treatment of protesters and counter protesters at some right wing militia groups gatherings this weekend, whereupon the police, um, it seems, failed to protect citizen and public safety um, in favor of allowing right-wing militants to um, wave guns at people. I find that to be very concerning. Thank you for hearing my comments and have a good day. My name is Marshall Jones and I'm calling to voice my complete and total opposition to any plans to build any new correctional facilities in Atlanta. I strongly urge the council to call for the immediate closure of the Atlanta City Detention Center as previously promised by our mayor and council members. I would also like immediate and decisive action to be taken against the Atlanta Police Department, especially Lieutenant Ellis, for their complete disregard for the safety of Atlanta citizens during the armed far-right militia protests on December 12th. That inaction resulted in over 30 heavily armed far-right militants taking over the underground Atlanta parking structure in order to threaten the citizens of Atlanta with their weapons. Not only did Lieutenant Ellis personally ignore 911 calls about these dangerous militants pointing their rifles at the citizens of Atlanta, but so did other members of the Atlanta Police Department when citizens complained and pointed out the activity in person. This complete and utter disregard for the safety and well-being of the citizens of Atlanta directly led to the physical assault of four unarmed Atlanta citizens who again received no attention and no help from the Atlanta Police Department. I also highly encourage the Public Safety Committee to closely investigate the Georgia State Patrol's action at the Capitol building when interacting with peaceful citizens of Atlanta. Time and time again, the Georgia State Patrol focuses on infringing the civil rights of anti-fascist groups while letting dangerous and heavily armed far-right militants take over entire city blocks and break laws in front of the Georgia State Patrol with no repercussions. The Georgia State Patrol, just like the Atlanta Police Department, does not act as law enforcement, but instead act as bodyguards for these dangerous far-right militias. Continuing to allow these armed far-right militias to break laws, harass, and assault Atlanta citizens with impunity gives these dangerous militants tacit permission to keep escalating, which, as we have seen in other major cities around the country, will end in ever-increasing violence and deaths. The city of Atlanta, as well as the state of Georgia, should both be ashamed of the Georgia State Patrol and the Atlanta Police Department. The Georgia State Patrol troopers who show up to the Capitol to harass peaceful citizens do not live in the city of Atlanta. 
they can't even navigate the city. Less than 15% of Atlanta Police Department officers themselves live in Atlanta. When these people show up, the vast majority of them don't care about the city or the residents because they don't live here. It's not their city. They need to quit seeing us as a nuisance, start doing their jobs, or quit. Lastly, I strongly encourage the council to make the usage of webcams mandatory for all sessions, especially for the public comment sections. The people of Atlanta already do not feel like their voices are being heard, and the usage of webcams during these meetings, which is a standard most other comparable cities have already adopted, is the smallest of gestures that can help begin to restore the community's faith in those that represent and are supposed to advocate on our behalf. Greetings to you, council members and staff. The special greetings to you, citizens of Atlanta, monitoring your government in action. Ben Howard, senior advocate, public policy analyst. Lingering among papers held in committee are legislative items related to enhancing our city's police force. Please take action on those legislative items for the benefit of the public. In Midtown Atlanta, there exists a crime-fighting unit called Midtown Blue. Proposed by some in Buckhead is a crime-fighting unit which would be called Buckhead Blue. I propose an additional crime-fighting unit which would be called Southwest Blue. Southwest Blue would work with Atlanta Police Zone 4 officers to make life better for the citizens who reside within neighborhood planning unit R and along the Campbellton Road and Cascades Road corridors. Be advised, however, that if you try to make any changes within neighborhood planning unit R, you will be met with fierce resistance from the NPUR 9. Anthony Robinson, Boris Clare, Ricardo Jacobs, Alvin White, Renette L. Scott, Allison Hathaway, Sherry Williams, and the NPUR9 cohorts, supporters, and enablers. Hello, I'm uh, Delano Elizabeth. I'm at um, as part of the events downtown yesterday and uh, Georgia State Patrol failed to adhere inadequately Please to take small events. So the Twitter, the uh, Trump supporters were allowed to move around unaccosted, unrestricted, while the people who were anti-Trump were monitored and mocked by the uh, Georgia State Patrol officers. <laughs> Lieutenant Elliot Ellis actually put people in danger by allowing them, by not addressing people who are on top of a garage, on top of a garage with scopes and monitoring the anti Um I hope that this is addressed. I hope that they stop emboldening white supremacists and Trump supporters to be violent towards people. I hope that your police department adequately addresses problems and stop monitoring. Um, so excessively monitoring anti-Trump people. I hope they address the people that were in, um, that I hope they address all these issues in order for the people to feel safe around the police, in order for the people to feel safe to protest that town. Thank you. Hi, this is Kelsey Bond. I live in Atlanta City Council District 2. I'm calling to let the Public Safety Committee know that I think that Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and the rest of City Council should uphold their promise to go to the Atlanta City Detention Center by the end of this year. At this point, there's absolutely no excuse to keep it open after constantly delaying this process of closing it down. Um, jails are not good for Atlanta. Uh, this represents a lot of money wasted that could be better spent elsewhere to actually help the community instead of continuing cycles of violence that only harm the community. Um, I also think that any plan to build a new jail to replace the Atlanta City Detention Center should be halted um, for the exact same reasons. Thank you, have a good day. Hello, I'm Caitlin Creason and I live in the Ormwood Park area. I've lived in Atlanta since 2016. 
And I'm calling to ask the mayor, Bottoms, and the city council keep their promise to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by December 1st. They also promised to replace the jail with the Center for Wellness and Freedom, which would be a much better place for us to send our tax dollars. We depend on you to make choices that will benefit the people of Atlanta. Sales don't make us safe, but a stronger community will. Thank you for what's doing best for our communities. Hi, my name is Gentry Staten, and I live in Decatur, but I've lived in uh, the Atlanta area and worked in the Atlanta area for a couple years now. Um, I'm calling to ask the city council to keep their promise to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by December 31st. They promised to replace that jail with a center for wellness and freedom, which would be a way better place for us to use our tax dollars. We depend on you to make choices that will benefit the people of Atlanta, and jails don't really make us safe, but a stronger community will. Thank you. Hey, this is Nolan Huber Rhodes. I live in North Atlanta and I've lived in the Atlanta area since I was 10 years old. So a pretty good while now and I love the city here. Um, I'm calling to ask that Mayor Tisha Lance Bottoms and the city council keep their promise to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by December 31st. I'm uh, really confused as to why it hasn't been closed yet. I'm really hoping that we can uh, get an answer to that and get it closed before the end of this year. Um, they also promised to replace that jail with the Center for Wellness and Freedom, which would be a much better place for us to send our tax dollars. We depend on you to make choices that will benefit the people in Atlanta. Jails don't make us safe, but a stronger community lit will. I'm calling just to ask you to please, uh, Mayor Bottoms and the City Council, please, uh, do this and do something. Take this opportunity to be a beacon to the rest of our country and to live up to the civil rights legacy that Mayor Bottom so often talks about. Thank you so much for taking our calls and considering this. I look forward to the closing of Atlanta City Council or Atlanta City Detention Center and I look forward to a, a resolution that says we will not be opening any new jails in its place. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nora Bonner. I live in Candler Park, and I'm calling to remind you once again to close the city jail. Uh, we want to see the Atlanta City Detention Center closed, and we'd love to see the money that would go towards keeping it open and uh, be reallocated towards social programs that would actually make the city more safe and better to live in. Thanks again. Bye. Hi, I'm Mary Pope. Um, I currently live in Old Fourth Ward. Um, I have lived in Atlanta since I was born, so 1986. Um, and I'm calling to ask that Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and the City Council um, keep their promise to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by the end of the year. Um, you also promised to replace the jail with the Center for Wellness and Freedom, which would be a much better place for us to spend our tax dollars. We depend on you to make choices that will benefit people in Atlanta. Uh, and jails actually don't keep make us safe, um, but some of you really well. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Hi, I am Brenda Nyam, and I am, I want to leave a few comments and questions. First, I would like to request that there be no new jails built, and I would like the council to push through on the promise on the closure of the Atlanta City Detention Center. I'd also like to ask why the Atlanta Police Department is acting biased, particularly on the events that occurred yesterday, December the 12th, on um, how they ignored the 911 call for wild white uh, militants or attacking people. And um, and why the treatment that posted the seat of the summer uh fall militants did not even know they were more violent. I would like the I would, I would like the council to push to I I think for for the police department to Excuse me. I'd like to um, to capture to um, 
because we talk this or actually talk to the boss to law and and protect the city against for little things. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Nicole Cabrera Salazar. Um, I am in the fifth district of Atlanta. I'm your constituent and I am calling to urge the city council and Mayor Bottoms to follow through on their promise to close um, ACDC and not to open a new jail in its place. Um, this is something that we've been, that has been in the public sphere for a while, especially after the many protests this summer. Um, and I urge you to make sure that this happens by the uh, December 31st date that Mayor Bottoms has promised. Thank you. Well, my name is Ayo Jolie Boy. I've lived in Atlanta for four years, and I'm calling to ask Mayor Keisha Lance Bonds a few questions. Uh, but first, I want to say congratulations. According to your spokesperson, you were offered a position in Joe Biden's cabinet, uh, but you respectfully declined, and let's just say for argument's sake, I actually believe that. Congratulations. I mean, really, you spent this entire year plainly, openly, and shamelessly seeking to raise your national profile and get the president elect attention, and you clearly have, so congratulations to you. Now, I'm wondering if you could bring your attention back to the city you govern and the people who elected you. Maybe I am unclear on a couple of things, uh, but I thought you were the mayor of Atlanta and that you said no more cash bail and that you said you were going to close the jail. So imagine my dismay when I find out that you're actually just the mayor of Buckhead. You're actually charging cash bail to peaceful protesters brutalized by your murderous police force. And you're actually spending $800,000 next year on security for the jail rather than closing it. Uh, like you said you would. Uh, maybe someone on city council could help me remind you, but you're not the president yet, you're not the vice president yet, uh, you're not in Biden's administration, you're not even the governor of Georgia. You are the mayor of Atlanta. So act like it and keep the promises you made. Thank you. Hi and good night. My name is Rogelio Arcilla. I live over on the West End off in Cascade for the golf course. I'm calling because uh, Atlanta City Council needs to listen to the constituents and not lie to them and close the jail. Uh, there's no reason to extend it six more months for 835000 and change. We're not to be going to free and accessible PPE for our public during a pandemic, once in a lifetime pandemic, and just mass evictions, mass unemployment, and the city can't afford anything, but to keep the jail open six more months? Like, you ought to be ashamed of your damn selves. It is not cool. It, it is just disgusting and a gross act on behalf of the city of Atlanta and those that run it. I'm sorry, but you've got to keep your end of the promise and close these jails. Thank you. And this is from a very angry resident, 30 year resident of Atlanta. Bye. I'm Jordan. Give out to the Spirit of Christ. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hope, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring up on Judah. And upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the evil that I have pronounced against them because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. And I have called unto them, but they have not answered. Jeremiah 35, chapter 17, verse. When a person or people hearken not to the warning of God or his voice, then you ask for his destruction or death. Then my God, my Jesus called you to be a Christ-like husband and man. When you refuse, you ask for death. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Romans 16, chapter 24, verse. Many manuscripts omit this verse. We need Jesus to lead us to life decisions that blesses us. Thou art weary in the multitude of thy counsels. Let none, let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly pronosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Isaiah 47, chapter 13, verse. Isaiah now pictures Babylon as a deposed queen who cannot do no more than sit in the dust. Flesh and knowledge will not deliver you like obeying God can. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. St. John 7, chapter 38, verse. 
the Messiah was to be a defender of the law. Yet Jesus seemed to be indifferent to be healing on the Sabbath. Should men make a law not to heal a person? I believe God is leading me to pray with the policeman to prepare for a potential bomb. But you have a chance to hinder it if you seek to obey Jesus. We need Jesus more than he need us. He has all power. We have little power. Obey Jesus and be Christ-like men and women and Christ-like children. Christ-like atmosphere to make the world a better place through Jesus. Thank you. Hello, my name is Megan Clark, and I've lived in Atlanta since 2015. And I'm calling to ask Mayor Bottoms to keep her promise to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by December 31st. She also promised to replace that jail with a Center for Wellness and Freedom, which would be a much better place for us to send our tax dollars. We depend on all of you to make choices that will benefit the people of Atlanta, and we know that jails don't make us safe, but a stronger community you know, will. Please do what's right for our city and our people. Thank you. Hi, this is Jacob Lugas. Uh, I'm calling in relation to the um, ACDC, the Atlanta City Detention Center. Um, I'd like to actually see it closed, um, as it was promised to me, and not wait for redevelopment planning. Um, I'd also like to voice my concern about the actions of the far right yesterday, uh, today is Sunday, so this past Saturday, um, you know, standing on the rooftops, pointing weapons at protesters, um, and basically having engaged more on the HUD. Um, yeah, I, I think those are the two major things that I wanted to mention in this forum. So, um, yeah, I hope you actually listen to these and uh, have a good day. Hello, I'm Tony Creekon, and I live in Virginia Highlands. I've lived in Atlanta since 2013, and I'm calling to ask Mayor Lance Bottoms and the City Council to keep their promise to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by December 31st. They are promised. They also promised to replace that the jail to replace that jail with the Center for Wellness and Freedom which will be a much better place for us to send our tax dollars. We depend on you to make choices that will benefit the people of Atlanta. Jails will make it safe, but a strong community will. Thank you for doing what's best for our community. Hi, my name is Mercy Montgomery. I'm leaving a message for the public comment period, I'm calling for accountability of the council to their commitment to close the Atlanta City Detention Center by the close of the calendar year. You received an incredibly thorough and informative report about how this will work for our community and I'm asking for accountability to the decision that was already made. I'm also asking that during these public comment periods, all council members have their videos engaged so that they demonstrate to the public that they're actually receiving and hearing the feedback that we're providing. I'm also asking for accountability and discussion regarding the police department officers and leadership who failed to ensure safety and didn't respond to calls from the public yesterday about far-right militants playing rifles members of the public and their response to um, activity in the area of the Capitol and unequal application of force to protesters who were protesting peacefully and trying to remain safe while ignoring the actions of those that were pointing weapons at members of the public. Thank you for listening, and I hope that you'll take this into consideration. Good afternoon. My name is John Peterson. I'm an Atlanta resident and a student at Georgia State University downtown. I'm calling to express my strongest disapproval that on Saturday, December 12th, the Atlanta Police Department allowed radical white supremacist militia groups to point guns at our neighbors from the rooftops of the underground parking deck without intervening. Lieutenant Ellis from Zone 5 should be dismissed and all other officers involved in the handling of this call should be investigated and disciplined appropriately. Incidents like these prove a sad point. In Atlanta, our police do not protect or serve us. Partially for that reason, I strongly oppose the building of any new jails and demand that ACDC is closed in line with the mayor's initial commitment. Atlanta police and correctional racket is not entitled to our tax dollars or our compliance until they work for us. The council should get a handle on the situation immediately. Our jobs depend on it. Hello, 
Okay. I believe that was our very last comment. Is that correct, Ms. Lindo? That's correct, Madam Chair. All right. We will now move on to communications. Uh, I think we have a couple of communication papers, and so we're going to ask Ms. Lindo to read the first one in. Uh, that's yes, on uh, 20.C-0146. Please, Ms. Lindo. Yes, Madam Chair. That's 20C-0146. This is communication from Mayor Keisha Lance Bonhams appointing Ms. Valerie Carey to serve as a member of the License Review Board. This appointment is for a term of two years. Um, Madam Chair, I'm hearing from staff that Ms. Carey is not on the line. Oh, really? Okay, so she's supposed to be here, correct? That's correct. Okay, so we will maybe hold this and hopefully before the end of the meeting, she can come back and you can let us know. And yes, let's go the, <laughs> the other piece of communication, let's just read it in. I, I think she's not here either, is that correct? That's correct. Want to go ahead and read it in? Yes, that's 20. Uh, 20. C-0147, this is a communication from Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, reappointed Ms. Michonne Williams to serve as a member of the License Review Board. This appointment is for a term of two years. Okay, and Ms. Williams is not here also, so we will hold that and hopefully come back for the first of the year. And just let us know if Ms. Carey comes in, Ms. Lindo, okay? Yes, Madam Chair. All right. So we're now up under... Uh, Madam Chair, do you want to vote on holding this one? Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Thank you. I forgot. I'm jumping ahead. Yes. Let's go ahead. A motion to hold. I'll make that motion to hold. Second. Hello. Second. Let's let Mr. Um, Vaughn do a second, Mr. Hillis, if you don't mind. That's fine. We're ready for the vote. Ms. Linda. One moment. The vote is open, Madam Chair. All right. Ms. Uh, Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. Thank you. One moment. Please vote. Everyone can please vote. Ms. Smith? Yay, but I, I pressed the little thing here. Is it not showing up? Yes, we have it now. Thank you. That's seven yays, zero nays. This item has been held. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We'll go back now to presentation. Uh, the first one we're going to ask is Mr. Justin Johnson could come on if y'all could unmute him and let him very briefly talk about ACDC, the Atlanta Correction Detention Center, and then we'll move to the rest of the presentation. I'm hoping he's on the line. Mr. Johnson. What? Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I, I believe you all can hear me now. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Outstanding. So um, just to convey at the request uh, of the chair that uh, we plan to introduce uh, a resolution in January that will provide some of the key points of our recommendation plan and also we'll call for a work session to be conducted. Now this work session will allow for the administration to present and discuss uh, the data a very robust analysis to city council that has led to the recommendation plan. So we absolutely look forward to providing our recommendations and engaging with the council, excuse me, to finalize this particular plan. And the one piece I, I certainly want to add is that we will also be introducing uh, legislation in January related to the um, Department of Corrections redeployment plan. So, um, so thank you for you know, raising the question and giving me the opportunity to just convey that publicly so that the uh, committee and council, uh, that you all have uh, something to look forward to. And also the public, as you, I don't know if you heard, but there's a lot of people asking questions about what are we going to do with the correction center. So I just want to make sure that people understood we are proceeding forward. Are there any questions from my colleagues? 
Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate that. Madam, Madam Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, Madam Chair. Yes. Is that, I'm sorry, uh, is it more effective? Yes, yes, I did. Um, and I'm sure uh, whatever they bring out on uh, in January, but I would hope uh, if you either could provide it in advance or as part of your uh, January report, just three things that I'm really interested in. One is if there's any debt or debt service that we're paying on the current facility. Uh, two, what contracts or any other uh, contractual obligations are going on there currently and, you know, what is going to happen with those. And um, then what was the third one? Um, I can't think of the third one right now. Oh, yeah, the third one is an important one, and I'm sure it has to be a part of your report. An understanding of how we're going to house people uh, charged with municipal offenses if we don't have our own facility. And those are the three things right now that I would love to, to hear more about when you report in January. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Ms. Lindo, did you ca capture that? And I want to make sure that we report that over to Mr. Johnson also so that they, they're clear about that. Yes, I have it. Uh, was there someone else who wanted to speak? I thought I heard another voice before Ms. Moore. I have a question, Madam Chair. Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Justin, for being here. Uh, yeah, I share the concerns of the council president. I'd like to see when you all make your report, uh, not, you know, what are going to be the recommendations going forward for uh, how we hold and, and maintain uh, inmates or arrestees going forward and how much is that going to cost us as a city? Uh, because that can become very exorbitant. Uh, going forward, given the number, the unpre unpredictability of how many arrestees you may have. If we have another summer of unrest in there, uh, lots of people who are arrested, where they're housed, how far away from Atlanta that might, may or may not be, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to just, you know, say, hey, we're going to house people in place X. I'd like to see a real analysis of what's going to happen. You know, we had this conversation, Ms. Moore, uh, perhaps Manager might recall, almost 10 years ago, and it was deemed financially unfeasible uh, to house them in other locations. So I'm interested in how that's going to go. Also, that's probably one of the largest commercial kitchens, uh, at least in the Atlanta metropolitan area, if not the southeast. Uh, we have a constant need uh, for during our camp best friends and the services that we provide uh, to, those, to, the, to those who are housing challenge uh, when that facility provides meals or lunches. Uh, two programs provides uh, meals and lunches, several senior programs around the city. And I'd like to know uh, what we're going to do if we do, do, don't have access to that commercial kitchen. Or is there a plan to continue to use uh, the kitchen, if not the building, uh, for some for some of those uses? Because in a lot of our senior programming, when we come back to, nor you know, some some level of, uh, of normality, uh, a lot of seniors depend on the food that's provided uh, from that. Uh, even though that kind of bleeds into the park and recreation conversation, you know, I'd like to see. Uh, some type of analysis, you know, of that as well. And also to help with the public, there are a lot of people who have a lot of misinformation about what the city's intentions really are and what the realistic timetable actually is. You've probably heard some of that in the call today, definitely heard it in the calls to the city council last week. If the administration prior to the legislation could just put out some bullets to say, hey, this is where we actually are, uh, because a lot of these activists are very good in uh, sounding the alarm, even though the alarm may not be 
uh, factually accurate, uh, but it gets people's uh, you know, it gets people's uh, anxiety up. And I think it would be good if the administrator just put out some bullets and say, hey, this is what we're planning to do in the public. So if people aren't bad or unwarrantly worried uh, about what the disposition of this facility is going to be. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, Mr. Bond. Uh, they, uh, as a public safety chair, they had been talking to me about some of these issues also. And originally they had talked about introducing something earlier uh, before the end of the year, actually at our last uh, council meeting. I questioned them. Some of the things that you all asked, I questioned them about it also. Very in particular, where are we going to go with our jail system in terms of if we close the jail particularly? what will happen to our folks that actually we know for a fact that we will have folks that will continue to be up under misdemeanors still be there. One of the things I explained to them is that I did not want them, we didn't want them, let me just say I did, want them going over to state jail because, you know, there are state laws are different than the city laws, and we've done a lot of reforms in terms of the city that ran the mayor's office and the council has done a lot of reforms around making sure that we just don't have our folks in jail forever for anything. And so those reforms will not be compatible with the state jails. And so as we talked about that, the whole question was where we put them. They are in the process of actually coming. When they come back next year, they will give us a report. So they want to take more time based on some of the questions you all asked, a lot of other questions I asked. That's why they said, council member, we're not going to introduce this. We're going to take time to make sure we succinctly have all of these things begin to have this discussion in a much more comprehensive way. I don't want us to be just putting out things just to say, okay, well, this is what we're going to do, and it's not something that we really get, can begin to work on. And where I hear the, hear the uh, community cries, uh, and some of it is righteously so, but some of it, I'm, as I'm hearing, may not be correct. But I do, it is really important to us. And we just, I want to take the time as a public safety chair, as a council member, to make sure and we work with the administration to get this right, not that we're just doing something, that we're really looking at this thoroughly and comprehensively. So that's why they're going to wait until the first of the year to come out and do something. So, but you're right, Ms. Moore and Mr. Bond, you all are on point in terms of your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, uh, there was one other point I was going to have, but thank you for your explanation. Um, what was my point going to be? Oh, but, you know, that is a, a valid point. Even though we've made reforms on a municipal level with a lot of these charges, to say, for example, on the uh, marijuana possession, you know, there was a spike in, a, in the population at the Fulton County Jail because the Atlanta police officers weren't using that law. They were still using the state law. So even some of the reforms that we put in place, if they're not applied, people still end up in the county jail with a state charge. So, I mean, we, we need to have a lot of discussions about how appropriately we're going to, I mean, police the city. I mean, because if we if we get to a point where we don't have a facility or some place to put our arrestees and we're not implementing uh, the municipal code, you know, we lose the right to have a police department. Because in our charter and in the state code, you can only stand up a police department if you're going to afford the municipal code. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion that needs to be had, you know, about all of this. So I hope that, you know, it's not just limited to, um, you know, whether the jail is open or not. I mean, if there's going to be a new fire facility built, there's going to be need. There's going to be a need for financing uh, for that. Uh, the expansion of the uh, police headquarters, and why I say that is because when we built the public safety headquarters, Atlanta, you know, the police and fire uh, headquarters, that the jail itself was used as collateral uh, to, to guarantee the bonds for that. So if if we don't we no longer have that facility, you know, what are we going to use as collateral if we're going to do some other type of financing to get these other things built? So I hope we have a, a broader discussion about public safety facilities and, and, and the like when we are discussing the disposition of this building. And with that, I'll yield.
you. All right. Was there any other comments from anybody else? If not, thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. Uh, we appreciate you coming and giving us that update. Look forward to talking to you next year. I think he may be on, um, well, hopefully he's still there and heard that. All right. We will now move on to the second part of our presentation. We will have an update by the Atlanta Police Department. Uh, I asked them the briefing will be one, not only just on streetcar racing, but just an update in terms of crime. I'm also, uh, so uh, Assistant Chief uh, Court is gonna come and talk to us about that. And as he presents that Chief Court, uh, Assistant Chief Court, uh, this whole thing that happened this weekend, I don't know if you can give us any information specifically on what went down, what happened, but I would appreciate that also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The one they were talking about in terms of the underground Atlanta and the protest is specific also. So, Assistant Chief Court, are you on the phone? Yes, ma'am. I'm right on Council Member Shepard and other Council Members. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. I will uh, start with the uh, talking about the street racing. Can you pull up uh, slide number three, the, the calls for service? Or um, slide number three, uh, as of now, we see that our calls for service relating to street racing has gone down. Uh, currently, it's at 135 calls, and that's a sharp decrease from November. Uh, we believe that the steps that we have taken to address the, the street racing with uh, citizens of Atlanta and people coming from out of town, we, we believe that the steps we have taken has uh, sharply decreased that. Although 135 is still too many, uh, it's a lot better than 568, which was what we had in October. We attribute a lot of that with the work that uh, the good uh, officers of, of our zones we're doing and also the members of our auto crimes enforcement unit. The uh, discipline that they showed and the uh, execution of enforcing the laws has sharply decreased that. If you'll go to slide number four, we can look at some of the numbers. I know that a lot of council members have asked us about the loud exhaust because it was basically uh, degrading our citizens' quality of life because of the amount of noise that it was making. Uh, this past weekend, our officers made 24 uh, charges related to the loud exhaust. So th that's, a, that's a, a pretty good increase. Overall, since we started enforcing it several weeks ago, we've made a total of 107 charges related to to loud exhaust. Also in that um, this past weekend, we arrested, we physically arrested three, three individuals. So again, uh, our officers are using discretion on who is gonna get arrested and how they are enforcing the laws. Also, we impounded five vehicles this past weekend. We, you all continually ask us how many people um, come in and organize these events. Uh, we, I have those numbers for you today. Um, we have arrested eight individuals that have organized or participated in organizing street racing events. We appreciate the uh, city ordinance that you all have assisted us with. So that has, has sent a message also we may not be able to arrest the individuals that night or that day, but again, with the work of our intelligence unit and our auto crimes enforcement unit, uh, using our LPRs and cameras around the city, we're able to obtain information to identify the people that are organizing these events, and we're able to take out warrants and go pick them up at later dates. So as I stated, uh, there are eight individuals that, that we have arrested. Out of uh, those eight individuals, only one of them stays in the city of Atlanta. Everyone else is, is from a, a, another city. So th that tells the story to me also that a lot of the people in the city aren't doing this. It's people that come from outside and, and they're creating havoc in the city. I'll leave it at that for street racing to see if anybody has any questions for me. And then I can uh, 
speak on some of the other issues you all may have. Question for Senate Racing. Madam Chair. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to compliment the police. Uh, right after um, we passed the uh, street racing measure that Councilmember Bond introduced, I noticed that uh, the police were able to, um, you know, kind of really put their teeth into their jobs and they had two or three people pulled over. I mean, I saw a lot on Lee Street because there's been a lot of street racing there. So I just really wanted to compliment the police on um, on what you're doing in regard to that. Uh, you have saved some lives as a result of, um, um, you know, just, just doing what needed to be done, you know, and sending a message to people who are, either in town or whether they're even not in town, you know, they don't live here, that we're not going to tolerate this type of behavior. So I just wanted to thank all of you for those efforts. Thank you. That's all I had, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. Mr. Bond. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Deputy Chief, for your presentation. And I also want to add my uh, kudos to the operations that APD has undertaken over the last few weeks that I have also noticed in the way that people would respond um, prior to uh, you all stepping it up and us passing the law and thank my colleagues for supporting uh, the law that we passed um, on street racing. You know, and I regret to say that you know, I lost a dear friend of mine a few weeks ago. But this was in the cab. Uh, young, young, young lady, uh, Jay uh, Johnson Stafford, who was killed by a street racer, literally two blocks from her home out there in the cab. So this is a very serious issue, and I appreciate what APD has done thus far to ameliorate it. But I do have a question. I, the complaints that I'm getting now are not necessarily about the street racers, but it's about motorcycle riders uh, in Midtown, motorcycles and ATVs. And this is activity that is going on in the primarily, I guess, on the weekend and some afternoons. Uh, but there was a lot of activity this weekend. A uh, constituent in Midtown forwarded me some uh, videos of it's almost like they're not even really going that fast but it's large groups of motorcycles and ATVs that they seem to come in bunches and kind of take over the street or block the intersections and they're on the sidewalks as well. Have you all been able to focus on some of that or how are you all dealing with that? Uh, council member, uh, yes, we are focusing on that also. Typically, um, in the past, those issues, uh, arise in the summer or when it's hot. Um, our officers focus on those individuals with the ATVs and the motorcycles along with the people that are doing the street racing. Um, because we have a no chase policy, again, we use the, the LPRs, and the cameras that are located in various places around the city to address those individuals. A lot of times the citizens may not see us arresting or citing those individuals right at that moment. Um, there's a lot of times where officers may come up or come around in their vehicles and they'll take off at a high rate of speed. So our officers know that they are supposed, they are not supposed to chase them. So they'll wait um, get the tag number, call it out to other individuals so those vehicles or motorcycles may be stopped in a different part of the city. Um, if we're able to get a good description of who's on the, the vehicle because our officers have the body cameras and dash cameras, sometimes we're able to take out warrants for those individuals also. So we are addressing that issue or those issues also. It just may not be 
right in front of the citizens that make make the complaint. Okay, well, I'd like to forward you some of the videos that I've got, and uh, I'll get your information from Miss Lindo and make sure that you have it because they they sent me several just from this past uh, weekend and one from last night. So I want to make sure that you get it. And I, again, want to uh, end with just saying how much I appreciate what you all have done uh, because uh, street racing is very dangerous. It's cost lives on our own street. You know, and again, you know, someone I've known since I was 12 years old, she lost her life, a mother, and uh, she leaves a son and a young young daughter who was in the car with her uh, when she got hit. And so, you know, this has real world consequences, and I appreciate uh, everything that you've done. But I'll get your information from Ms. Lindo, and I'll forward you these videos. Thank you, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Assistant Chief uh, Corey, I do have a question. Going back to the mufflers. Now, I will say, I'm going to say thank you all also that all over on Metropolitan Parkway in my district where I've seen, I've witnessed it a lot and see a lot, the streetcar racing has gone down. However, there's a lot of folks, and I'm not sure if they come out of town, I think some of these people with these loud mufflers, they live in the city. I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting to see, but I have seen this even this past weekend, last week. I mean, people just going up and down Metropolitan Parkway. You can hear them at night. Uh, going up and down the street, um, just, you know, loud mufflers. And they're not, at this point, they're not in a group. It's just them individually. And it's obvious that they're purposely doing it. They get a thrill out of it. They think it's something great to just have these mufflers just for people to watch them and pay attention. So I don't know how y'all are going to deal with that, but that's still a big issue that I think that if we don't do something, that's a culture that's being created that we've got to stop. And so I'm hoping that y'all continue to pursue that also. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let, let me clarify. Um, when I spoke about the individuals that were not in, not from the city or not living in the city, that was for individuals that were organizing these street racing events. Um, as far as the citations for the loud mufflers, all of our zones, all of the officers throughout the city uh, have been issuing those So it's not just in zone two or in zone five, our officers all over the city are, are putting, giving out those citations. Also, our auto crimes enforcement units, they are going around and, and making some visitations to some shops that are uh, enhancing vehicles. So I'll just leave it at that. But, but we're attacking it from several different, several different fronts. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Chair. Hold on, Mr. Uh, Faroki sure. has a question. And sure. More and I'll, I'll recognize you. But Mr. Faroki has a question. Thank Mr. you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I caught a little bit. I had to get pulled away for a quick second, so I apologize that this is redundant. But two questions. One is on the, the loud exhaust. I appreciate the increase in citations. Um, I encourage APD to, to continue it. It continues to be the, the largest, um, I think, frustration for most of the residents in, in my district. Um, I think the street racing has decreased. Uh, and I say that the reckless driving lane drag has decreased, but there still seems to be kind of a, a constant level of um, muffler exhaust noise and, 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 and to some extent street racing. The, the, the frustrating thing that has continued with uh, a, some level of regularity is the ATVs on the weekends. I will tell you every weekend from kind of 2 to 6 p.m., and I'm sure you're all aware of this, but coming through Midtown and to other parts of the city are the, the ATV crowds, and they oftentimes congregate at the BP across from the varsity and then start leave from there or stop there and then continue from there. And I, I think there's some frustration from residents and a little bit for me as well that we know when it's happening every weekend, and yet uh, there seems to be um, – no effort to try and snuff it out. And I, I know we can't chase, and I know these folks run, but uh, if you've already addressed this, I apologize. Is there anything we can do knowing that there's some regular cadence to it? It doesn't seem as spontaneous as it was earlier in the year um, that y'all can do to help uh, get a get a handle on it. Well, um, as, as I stated earlier, we have our intelligence unit and our auto crimes enforcement units uh, look into it. They 
they provide additional assistance to the officers in the zones. There are individuals that we become aware of that organize these events and come in. We have to be careful and make sure that those individuals are violating a law when they come into the city. Um, but we are watching them and when we find that they do violate laws, whether it's a city ordinance or state law, we do go on and make the, the proper charge, uh, whether it's just giving them a citation or impounding their, their vehicle, whether it's an ATV, a motorcycle, or, or a car. So we're trying to make sure that we don't violate anybody's rights along with enforcing the laws. But, but we're, we're aware that there are certain areas that they congregate in on a, on a frequent basis. Um, and yes, we're aware of it. We're aware of it. it it's some things I don't want to, uh, I guess, give away, but we're aware of a lot of things that they do. Okay. Uh, without divulging trade secrets, I, uh, I won't press further, but I would encourage y'all to continue to, to, to work on it. Uh, do we use our helicopter in this, in this work or is it used for other purposes? No, when, um, when our intelligence, uh, gives us that information we do use the, uh, we do use the helicopter along with the lprs and the cameras throughout the city so the helicopter provides great assistance along with partnering with our neighboring jurisdictions so it's not just atlanta that's um, experiencing this problem it's uh metro wide it's it's nationwide but our partners around the area provide a lot of assistance with, with us or for us. Um, and not only in in physical presence, but they provide intelligence to us also if they get some information that somebody may be, or that a group may be coming to the city, they'll call up our investigators and officers and let us know so that we, so that we can make the proper plans to be ready for those individuals. We believe that the number of incidents has dropped because we are aware of the frequent locations they go to. Because Atlanta is so large, there are a lot of places that they like that we can't um, be there in a show of force with all, at all of the places. But at some of the locations, we make sure that we are there before they are there. And when they arrive and they see Atlanta police officers or Georgia State Patrol, um, they decide to go somewhere else. So we believe that has caused the numbers to drop also. Thank you. That's, that's all I have. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Moore. Uh, yes, just quickly back on the ATVs, because uh, this they have in the off-road bike has been going on for years and uh, when I was on council, Ms. Shepard was really involved in that and so we said they're not supposed to be on the road and you mentioned that you use the license plate readers but the off-road bikes and the ATVs do not have license plates. Um, so you must be just using body cam to get them because you mentioned that you were using the license plate readers which they don't have any. I was not, uh, yes ma'am, I was, I was not referring to license plate readers for the ATVs because most of the ATVs and also the dirt bikes don't have right. license plates. Um, and yeah, what we've also I was noticed, kind of correcting what you were saying because I'm like, well, how can he use the license plate readers when they don't have license plates? So you must be using body cam or something else because they don't have license plate. I just wanted to correct that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I was speaking in, in, in general terms with the ATVs, the motorcycles, the, the vehicles that are doing the street racing. I was speaking to all of them a, a, as a group and listing everything that we use as far as the LPRs, the, the cameras, the, um, the air unit. Uh, we, we use everything at our disposal to identify these individuals. Is that it, Ms. Moore? I'm done, Ms. Moore. Yeah, and let me just put Ms. Moore said. I just want to, I'm glad you brought it up because the history of this has been long. This is Ms. Moore, no, I worked on this for years, uh, maybe about maybe eight, 
10 years ago in terms of really attacking. Now it's all these cars. But back then it was the ATVs, and the ATVs are still out there. And But ATVs are legislated by the state. And so one of the things that we tried to do in the city was to say, put a license plate on ATVs. It's because they're all-terrain vehicles. And in rural areas, uh, when we went to the state and actually talked to so many state legislators about it, uh, Commissioner, I mean, uh, State Representative Pat Garner was, he advocated with me, and Robinson was involved, but we really did everything we could at the state to try to get the state to legislate that ATVs would have a, a tag, just like a car or motorcycle or anything else. And the people in the state in rural Georgia were said no, that, you know, they, that, that they don't have a problem on their country roads with this because ATVs really are for country roads and out in the mud and the dirt in the woods and things. But what has happened is they've come here in the city of Atlanta and they actually have them on the street. What we were able and successful in doing was to say no more ATVs. We were actually by city law, the state allowed us to create our city law that didn't put a tag on it because that was a state change. But we could allow every city to create their own legislation around ATVs. Through that process, we were able to say no ATV should be legally on the streets of the city of Atlanta. But the challenge in uh, Assistant Chief Court can talk about this is that how do you catch people on ATV? You know, if they're flying and then you know, we have a no chase law and we're trying to do that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm glad that y'all are being aggressive and trying to do everything you can because you're right. This year we've seen more of motorcycles and these cars and it's great that we can identify them. But the ATVs were in the mix of this also. So at some point we have to go back to this ATV thing again. I don't know if we can go back to the state and begin to add and bring up the question again of should we can we ask for ATVs to have license plates like every other vehicle? But it was pushed back real hard on us at the Capitol before. But that may be something we want to look at in 2021. Just want to give you all some history for folks who are new on this. Thank you. And Ms. Shepard, just to throw in my my uh, part of the discussion when we had it last time, I don't think that we should worry about trying to get license plates for them because one they're not going to do it and we can't stop them whether they have them or not uh, so that doesn't mean that because we require license plates that they would actually get them and we're, we're still in the same situation so i just think it's an enforcement issue and you know whatever we can do to uh, add resources to the department maybe they need some atvs um, and then we may, you know, the chase policy, I think, has a lot to do with it as well. But I'm sure they're doing the best they can with trying to identify the the people who are on the vehicles. They're all on the Internet. So, I mean, it's easy to uh, identify them. Thanks. Well, I, I, the only reason I said the, the license plate is because at least if, just like what they did when they found people later on and they locked them up for their cars for Drag racing, they could at least identify them and then find, track them to their house and identify who they are. Right now, we just see ATV, so we don't have any way to identify them with anybody. So that was why I was pushing that so hard. But we, we'll, we'll talk about that later, just give them just a little history. But thank you all, uh, Chief Court, Deputy Chief Court, for all you do. So we're going to move on to the next topic. You had, yes, I, I think you. You have some other topics too, I believe, that you've uncovered in terms of your presentation. Well, um, I was asked to speak uh, briefly on the the overall crime uh, in in the city. Currently, yes. um, currently we are down overall in in crime. However, uh, our violent crime, specifically our uh, homicides and aggravated assaults, are up. Um, Predominantly uh, in the zone of space or southwest Atlanta is where we have seen a, a increase in in our violent crime. Um, with that, uh, several weeks ago, uh, Chief Bryant had a, a a media release with some of our federal and, and local partners, where we had identified several individuals that were creating havoc throughout the city. They didn't just focus on one part of the city. 
they um they did their their business throughout the city um although we identified and spoke about those individuals that operation is still continuing so we are still continuing to work with our, our federal partners i.e the the fbi the u.s attorney's office uh the dea and bringing the the most violent and repeat offenders um and put put them in jail we're still focusing on them we're also working with our local partners such as the cab county south fulton clayton county to identify individuals that that have violent warrants and our fugitive team is identifying them and picking them up on a continuous basis uh several weeks ago uh we have re the Atlanta Police Department released uh, Atlanta's top 10. So we have been able to identify and apprehend several individuals off of the top 10 list. These are individuals that we um, put out and make sure that the people, the citizens of the metro area are aware of these individuals. And because of that top 10 list, we have gotten several leads that has has led to the apprehension of those individuals. Um, the other issue that bothering or plaguing the city are auto thefts and auto larcenies. The auto thefts are particularly troublesome because we've noticed that the majority of vehicles that are stolen either have the keys or key fobs in the car or the key or the vehicle is running um just last week i'll say about 80 percent of the vehicles in zone five that were stolen had the keys in them so that's making it hard for us our auto crimes enforcement unit uh, that's their primary focus i know i spoke with spoke on them uh as far as how they were assisting the city with the street racer with their primary mission is to go after the people that steal vehicles and they're doing a an outstanding job just last week they had over 10 arrests and they continue to recover stolen autos but again it's making it very hard for us to stop this trend when the majority of the cars are left running as far as the auto larcenies we've noticed that a lot of the juveniles are the ones that are committing the the auto larcenies. We know that because of COVID, uh, school is not in. And so at various times, juveniles can continuously walk up and down the street. And we know we know that it's juveniles because our officers have, have chased them. Um, and we've seen them in vehicles driving up and breaking out car windows and taking things out of cars. So we've made a number of arrests with that also but it continues to be a a, a bad trend a, a bad issue that we have to that we have to deal with um i'll leave it at that to see if anyone has any questions for me well you know i'm looking at your report that you gave in terms of what some of the things you talked about this last map you have which is on uh I don't know what that page is. This this call the uh, call to service here today. For three, uh, three, 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 three. Uh -huh. Now is that call, is that considered what you define as a heat map? A heat map that is that because I'm looking at the call to service. You know we got into this conversation last week when we had a, a presentation on um, police department and where we are and we we imagine the police department. We looked at our heat map because we've been having a lot of crime up in Buckhead. We've been having a lot of crime in this town, and actually, this this particular presentation it kind of reflects calls to service uh, through December to to December. So, when I'm looking at this map. It has red, which is up in the, I think it's zone two, uh, but it appears that zone one has the highest call to service right now, uh, year to date, and then zone two. No, ma'am. Um, is that how I'm reading that? Correct me. Currently, the uh, zone two has high for service. If, if somebody will pull up page uh, five of, of, of this slide, 
Zone two has the highest school for service at 130, over 132,000. Zone one has the lowest number of calls for service. So basically just the calls for service means the amount of times individuals are calling in. Um, it has nothing to do with how many people we have in that area or the focus we put in that area. That's just the number of calls that the citizens of that community, the citizens of Atlanta call in. So zone two typically will call in a, a lot more than other parts of the city. Okay. So zone two right now has the, the largest amount of calls for services, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry? Yes, that, that is correct. Zone two has the highest number of calls for service followed by zone five. Zone five has uh, just over 129,000. And as I mentioned, zone two has 100 and, over 132,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that helps in terms of people talking about who, what, when, where, how, because I, I get that over here is that people say, well, you know, things are going on. Now, calls and service is different from, would you say the calls and service is different than what actually happens? Calls and service is one thing, but in terms of what really goes on, in terms of crime, how would you correlate the two of those in terms of, like you talked about, auto theft, larceny, and all these different things? Is that the same scenario? It's it's diff it's the same but different. It's like a bowl of food. Zone two typically has challenges as far as auto thefts um, and auto larceny. Whereas we look at zone three or zone four and zone they have different challenges. So I would not say that um, they will have more or less crime. They just have different, different that they have to deal with. So again, calls and service could be entirely different than when you break it down to say where where actual the crimes are happening. We need to be looking at not only calls and service, but where are the actual crimes in terms of data, in terms of crimes also. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as I mentioned, Zone Two's issues are auto, could be auto thefts and auto larcenies. Whereas in Zone 4, they don't have as many auto thefts as in Zone 2. But Zone 4 may have more aggravated assaults than Zone 2. So it, it, they, they, have, they, they have get, But they don't get as many calls for service. If you don't get as many calls for service. No, typically the um, citizens in Zone 2, I'm sorry, in Zone 4, no call nine one as much as the zone two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think you know as we're talking about these particular things, we need to. I mean, for me, and that was one of the things I was talking about last week is that it's very mind blowing in terms of how crime is different. But people are calling for one thing when that calls for another. And I'm not, let me just say this and put this out on point. I'm not putting one neighborhood against another because I think in what's happening and sometimes in my community, we hear gunshots and things so much that we just become, it's just, we accept it. We don't even call anymore. Whereas people in another neighborhood, when they see stuff, they just call it in. And so, and what I always tell my folks in my district, please call in. I'll go to a meeting and they'll tell me all these things that happen. I'm like, did you call the police? Well, no, I didn't call the police. I was scared or I was this, I was that. But again, as we're talking, as we begin to vet these things as in terms of public safety, we need to do some real crossovers in terms of understanding the analysis of how all this happens and what's going on with that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am, it, it, it does. We understand because we we look at it and what we do is we meet every morning to go over the challenges so we'll know where we need to move um, or how we need to assist the students. So we, we look at it on a, on a daily basis. We don't just look at it once a week. We look at it every single day. 
And bottom line is we need more police officers and so we need to do a better because probably cannot reimagine the police department. But when we're looking at this, we have to be looking at all this stuff and understanding it's in so many different angles and levels. It's got so many pinnacles out there that of different variations of why things happen the way they do. Thank you. You've given me clarity on that. Anything else? I have a question right. about it. Mr. Bond. This this will be quick quick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Deputy Chief, I, I just wanted to ask, on these circumstances that, that our violent crime is up, are these crimes that are uh, where there's a relationship between the individuals or are they like aggravated assaults as a result of, you know, robberies, you know, stranger on stranger or is, 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 I'm, I'm just wondering why there's, if, if it's, COVID related with people just being packed in together that they get frustrated and they lash out or what what are the majority of circumstances around these, these violent crime incidents? Well, what we are finding is that uh, most of the violent crimes are acquaintances. I would not say that they are friends or related, but they know each other um, some type of way. Uh, some of it is, is gang related. Some of it um it is it, business related uh illegal business related but they were acquaintances when we had a a rash of shooting incidents uh last month what we found was that there were a number of individuals coming from out of state because they thought uh georgia and atlanta was open so they were coming to atlanta to party and when they were coming down here, they felt that because nobody knew them, they could get away with certain things. So when they came, they would uh, maybe bump into somebody or have words and look at each other and in a way they thought was disrespectful and we would have a shooting incident. Some of those incidents occurred when we had officers right at the location, but that didn't stop them again because they felt that nobody knew them and as long as they were able to get away from that officer at that time, they would be able to get away with it. But because we have dedicated officers, we've been able to make a number of arrests related to our homicides and our aggravated assaults. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Assistant Chief Court, I appreciate your uh, coming forward today and uh, with your report. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, Chairman, uh, uh, Chef, ahead, let, let me just say one thing. Because I'm from the Midwest, and I'm I'm glad that I heard Deputy Chief Court say what he did because I don't want bad elements that are coming down here from the Midwest doing their partying to think that the, we are just pushovers. And I know we're not, but for them to think that we're pushovers in terms of them coming down here with their guns, because that's what they've been doing, coming down here with their guns yeah. and thinking that they're going to take over or do what they want to do like they're doing what they want to do up in the Midwest. That's not going to happen. And I know that because we have the type of police leadership that we have, that we're not going to let them do that. And so I'm glad to hear that we're sending that message. And Deputy Chief Coit, we need to continue to send that message because there's some bad, bad people up there. Okay? And we don't need them down here. We really don't because it will turn this town out. And that's not what we want. Okay, so I appreciate what you're saying. So stay on the, stay on the job like you're doing. We're behind you. Okay, because we don't need that element down here in the city of Atlanta at all. Okay, so thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. Okay. So we'll now move on. Thank you again, Assistant Chief Court, for, for your support and what, what all you bring to us. Appreciate that. We're now going to move on to the second item on our presentation. That is uh, Chief Judge Chris, uh, Christopher Porter's 
Who's going to bring us a report from the municipal court? Thank you. Chief Portis. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, it's a pleasure to be here for the municipal court to give this last quarterly presentation for calendar year 2020. Uh, just wanted to take just a few minutes to provide an update on where we are with COVID as well as our operational status since the last time uh, we were here and presented. Uh, for just, uh, we have a presentation, uh, but just to uh, introduce it, uh, back on October the 21st is when we first began the process to open the doors uh, of the court to the public, and we opened the four facing windows uh, under our current COVID policy. Uh, the week beginning October the 26th, we opened uh, some of the courtrooms and allowed those who had court dates or otherwise wanted to walk in to uh, see a judge to resolve those cases on a soft or uh, trial opening. And then the week of November the 2nd, we began hearing uh, cases that were actually scheduled by notice uh, under our current COVID uh, protocol. So as we're here today, we're rounding out our ninth week um, of operations. Uh, moving on to the uh, next slide, the slide numbered as two. Uh, this is just some information to put into uh, perspective the caseload and total numbers of cases that have been opened uh, during the COVID period from March through November. Uh, the totals for the month of March and April are slightly off of our usual, which is around 12,000 per month. And then you see the uh, dip during the COVID summer, but nonetheless, throughout this period from March to now, there still have been uh, just shy of 62,000 cases uh, opened at the municipal court during this period. Uh, moving on to the slide numbered as three um, is the converse, if you will, of that reality, which are uh, the cases that have been closed during the uh, COVID period uh, from March through the present uh, 34,500 cases um, have been closed. Uh, you see the months of April through October, so even during the time that the court was at least closed to hearing cases in person, that there were still opportunities and avenues for individuals to still resolve cases um, if they wanted to do so without actually coming to court. Uh, the number for the month of March and the amount of 8,000 um, is more on track with our target of where we are under normal operations. And if you look to the month of November, you see that those numbers are beginning to increase uh, and we'll expect it to do so as volume and the number of individuals who are physically coming uh, begin to close those cases as well. Uh, under our COVID protocol, uh, we are still uh, allowing and operating multiple different avenues and will continue to do so for the general public to close their cases in addition to physically coming uh, to contest their case in per person, uh, which is still their right to do so. Uh, moving on to the slide number as four, uh, this slide uh, shows uh, the case types as well as the numbers of cases that um, have been rescheduled since uh, the COVID closure. Uh, of course, out of that number, uh, or at least not included in this 49,000 figure of the cases that obviously have already closed. Uh, but right now where we stand, um, everyone who received a court date either before COVID or during the COVID closure um, has now received uh, an initial court date. So uh, since we've been the court dates and have already come in, many of which have closed their cases, uh, but uh, nonetheless, if you got a court date or a ticket uh, during COVID, you have received um, a court date either for now or for some time in the future. Uh, where we stand now on our projections is by the time that we reach the first or second week 
in February of 2021, we would have cycled through uh, all of the COVID cases that we have. And at that point, we'll only be hearing uh, newly issued cases and citations. Uh, there on the screen to the left is just an example of the postcard that is going out to the general public uh, using uh, the postcard as the notice to appear uh, so that we can get those dates and that information out to the general public as fast as possible. Uh, we are required by law to make sure that individuals do get a notice to appear, and there are some parameters about what is to be included in the language on that notice. Um, also, the types of cases that have been rescheduled, uh, which spans the entire uh, realm of the cases that we hear uh, at the court. Uh, moving on to the slide number is four. It's just an example of the court docket that we are running under the new uh, COVID uh, protocol. This is the slide number is five. Um, so uh, before COVID, obviously, we had the ability to run very, very large calendars and call in large numbers of people at one time. Well, for a lot of really good reasons, that is contrary to where we are uh, during this COVID time, as well as the requirements that have been set forth for courts operating under the Chief Justice of the Georgia Supreme Court's emergency declaration. Uh, so we are running much smaller calendars, number one, and most importantly, to keep spacing uh, and keep the staff and the general public safe. Uh, so the chart that you're looking at now was just a general layout of how the court has spread out throughout the day, um, its various calendars, um, beginning at 8 a.m. and the last calendar running at 3 p.m. And the building closes early uh, from our usual time at 4 o'clock every day so that we can do a specialized cleaning to make sure that the operation is ready to begin uh, the next day. Uh, so each courtroom uh, runs at least three dockets daily, uh, most four dockets daily with the fourth docket being a reset docket for status and trial, uh, new cases being set on three calendars, and those calendars for each courtroom maxed at 20 to ensure that we have the required amount of spacing, not in, not only in the courtrooms, but also in the general areas as individuals move throughout the building, ensuring that we have at least six feet and we have the spacing in the stairs and the elevators to accommodate those realities. Uh, moving on to the slide uh, number to six, uh, this is just a comparison of the logistics of how those court dockets impact the volume of cases. Uh, and here you have what it looks like pre and post COVID. So pre COVID, the total numbers of calendars that we ran every day was 35, uh, courtrooms running at least two, uh, with maximum capacities of 125. Uh, post COVID, where we are now, the court is running 55 calendars, uh, every day. Maximum position on each calendar is set at 20. The average number of cases that we calendared and heard pre-COVID, 967, post-COVID, 660. And as you move down, you see it has an impact on the cases per week as well, 4,800 down to 3,300. Um, obviously, as we move through time, uh, the efficiency of being able to handle cases in alternative means will make up some of the capacity that we used to have during uh, pre-COVID, and that is actually a welcome as we look towards technology to help uh, to make the court going experience a little bit better for the public. Uh, court systems are often slow to evolve, but one positive out of COVID is that the way that you can interact with uh, the court system to handle certain business, should you choose, uh, will be multifaceted uh, and more user-friendly. Uh, moving forward to the slide numbered as seven, uh, just a snapshot of the total visitors that we have had um, to check in. One of the things that I told this body uh, when we first went through our uh, planning for opening before we opened for COVID were some of the new and interesting things we'll be using technology to do. One of them is to check into the building um, as well as manage the space. So uh, what you see here is uh, one of the notices that the general public comes in contact with as the 
exterior of the general entrance. They take out their phones. They scan that uh, IR code. It takes them to a website, uh, and they enter uh, their name and what they're there to conduct business for, whether it's to go to court or to retrieve a certified document from the clerk's office. Uh, but inside of this, they also will take a general COVID questionnaire about whether or not they've had COVID, come in contact with COVID or otherwise sick. And this is before they even come into the building. They then receive a text message from whatever department they're there to visit, whether it's a courtroom or the clerk's office, uh, telling them to approach the security checkpoint, at which time uh, they're temperature checked and verified to have on uh, facial covering before they're allowed to proceed into the general area of the building. Uh, looking at the few days that we were open for October, we had 406 individuals check in and enter the building for the month of November. Uh, just over 4,000 individuals checked in and entered the building. And all for the month of December, uh, just short of 3,000. And the figure for December um, is through uh, this past Friday, December the 11th. Moving forward to the slide numbered as eight, uh, things that we're doing differently uh, or new things to uh, make sure that we are responsive to the various things that are going on, especially matters of counsel and public concern. We have created a new division of the court, which we have termed the complex or aggravated traffic and criminal division. Uh, specifically, this division cases will be routed for reckless driving, fleeing and attempting to elude, hit and run, aggressive driving, drag racing, lane drags, street racing, excessive and high rates of speed, ATV violations, uh, executive order violations, and other matters of public concern as they arise. Uh, the judge who will be presiding over this division is uh, Judge Christopher Ward, who is the uh, deputy chief judge as well and has uh, an extraordinary amount of experience here at the court with streamlining processes. Uh, what we wanted to do was make sure that these cases were routed to a singular point, number one, for tracking, but also, two, to ensure that they got the attention that they needed to get, as well as in the time that they needed to get it. Uh, so these cases, whether they uh, come in by citation, but especially if they're resulting from any arrest, will go to Judge Ward within two weeks of arrest for arraignment. Uh, and these cases are placed on an efficient fast track so that from arraignment to ultimate case resolution, uh, that that happens in a relatively short amount of time uh, and then pulled out from our general uh, traffic uh, volume, which is uh, you know very voluminous. So this allows us to pay fo uh, special focus and attention on the hot button cases. Uh, on the line right now is uh, Judge Ward, and I wanted to at least give him the opportunity by way of introduction uh, to address this body, to just let this body know what to expect um, as he continues with organizing and streamlining these cases uh, as we move into the future. All right. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, Madam President, and uh, members of the uh, council members of the committee. Um, I have served in the uh, municipal court since 2012, and since I've been here, I have had the opportunity to uh, improve operations here in the court as, uh, you know, presiding judge of the DUI division. Uh, we uh, started our FTA warrant division, and the same effective case flow management uh, uh, methods and strategies that we employ to uh, more or less uh, reform those divisions will be applied in the, um, the newly created complex aggravated traffic and criminal division. Um, I would like to state, and uh, Judge, uh, excuse me, Chief Judge Portis did not, did not state it, uh, we have two divisions that have been seeing 300 cases or more per week, and that's the housing division and this newly created division. So we are getting these uh, cases in, uh, they're on the docket. We are limited to 20 per docket at four times per day. Normally, my courtroom would see anywhere from 80 to 160 people a day to the tune of 25,000 just in 2019, more than any other court in the state of Georgia. And that was through the FTA warrant division. And as I stated, we are going to continue our successful uh, effective case flow management in this new division. 
uh, we look forward to some, uh, you know, positive reports and, and more importantly, addressing these matters that uh, these cases that are made uh, by our police department and presented by the solicitors. Um, I will also state that uh, the solicitors, as well as the public defenders, have staffed the new complex aggravated trap in the criminal division with uh, two solicitors uh, and, and, and two public defenders. So we are equipped. We have the resources and, and, and as well as the, uh, the management uh, of these cases by way of the court. And I uh, thank you all for having me, and uh, I can entertain any questions should you have any. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh Wall, for being here. And um, my colleague, I think that's the end of your presentation, too, is it not, Josh Porter? Yes, that is actually the, the last slide, and you can move on to so the final slide, yeah. which is the thank you slide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's open it up for questions. Uh, let's start with uh, any questions for our honorable uh, Judge Ward, Deputy Chief Judge Ward. Do you have any, we have any questions? Or for Judge Porter. Well, y'all yeah, well, I have a question. This is Councilmember Winslow. Um, okay. And I, I, first of all, I want to, I think I sent something to Judge Porter asking him about the, uh, how many homeless, uh, persons we had served and, uh, where we had sent them. So, um, in regard to that, and I'm not sure this is the met, uh, uh, who's over the homeless court? Is it, is it Judge Ward or is it Judge Porter, Chief Judge Porter? Uh, I preside over the uh, homeless court. This is uh, Judge Porter. Okay. So as, as people are coming in, I'm trying to see the best way to to say this. Twenty in 1996, the city council con had tried to tackle this issue um, with the homeless. Uh, so when people come into the court system. Are they able to, once they come to your court and they're, you know, released to whomever for the, uh, for the care that it, it is that they need? Are they, who's tracking that? Are they able to get that care? And let, let me tell you why I'm asking. And this may not have anything to do with my question. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm continuing to seeing homeless encampments in different areas. You know, we, the city cleans up one area and they come back, or the city cleans up another area and they come back. So I, I'm, I'm trying to see how, how, how are we moving the process and what are we doing to ensure that these individuals are not back on the street because that's even worse than anything else because, you know, they're, they're unable to find a place to use the bathroom, to clean themselves when they're in these tents. And that's just, a, it, 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 it's, um, it's inhumane for them to be in these tents. I don't know who these people are that are providing these tents. That's not a good thing. That's keeping them in the same deprivation that they're currently in. It's not moving them to the next level. So, can you help me with that? Sure. And you know, just to the to the general comment, uh, one of the things that we did early on before we even embarked upon getting the program up and going was we traveled out to Houston, uh, Texas, which is a city. Uh, that has a homeless population um, in, in, in composition similar to Atlanta, but at one point larger in numbers. And the issue of the temporary tent is an oft 
debated issue of, you know, whether or not it is helping or hurting uh, the situation. So that is something that is uh, still a focus um, of debate for those who are aiming to do something uh, especially positive about the those who are in, in, in the most desperate need of attention and help. Um, as for the program itself, uh, the whole idea of the program is to get an individual uh, connected with resources, as you pointed out, as fast as possible. Because if we can identify someone as a participant as early in the court process as possible, the likelihood of their success is that much greater. Uh, the program itself, the day-to-day administration of the program, um, is run by a licensed uh, clinician. And there is a staff of individuals in our Restore Atlanta program uh, that are tasked with being the caseworker for each individual. Individuals have, as soon as they are brought into the program, are set up with a schedule of check-in with their ind- with their individualized case manager. And for many of those folks, those check-ins uh, are often on a daily basis when they first get brought into the program. And obviously there is also a immediate assessment of what are the most dire needs for each individual, uh, because some folks have substance abuse problems, some people have uh, traumatic experience problems, and the reason that one person is living on the street may not be the same as the next. So an individualized plan for each person um, is developed, and that is done uh, in short order. And the contact and level of contact um, is intense, especially when the person is beginning the program. Uh, we have had some folks that, for instance, have made it off of the street, living on their own, and who are now employed, taking care of themselves. But as you can imagine, with the cycle of homelessness, we also have individuals who get into the program that we will see again for a new, a new offense before we begin to make the traction. Um, it is a uh, very uh, personalized journey, and it is a lot of very difficult work uh, to engage and work to get these individuals to help um, and sometimes secure that they need to break the cycle of homelessness. It's also a very resource intensive uh, proposition uh, because a lot of the folks that we see on the court side are individuals who we see very often. It's not uncommon that our participants, when we get them into the program, are folks who have cycles of 20 to 30 offenses in a relatively short amount of time. And that is a, an often uh, a red flag to let us know that this individual is somebody who we need to look at because we also want to help break that cycle. And it's not just about the individual, it's also about the broader Atlanta community. Uh, we have also been working with the uh, Atlanta Downtown Alliance and uh, organizations like Central Atlanta Progress to hear from what they have to say, their experiences, and making sure that we're incorporating some of our remedies in what we are trying to do and making sure that we're having a positive impact on the greater, uh, at least in greater Atlanta downtown community um, as well. So, um, you know, it, it's something that, as I said last year, that we'll be coming back asking for additional resources. We often uh, have a hard time uh, securing those, uh, but it is a continuous uh, work in progress with the ultimate goal of not just helping the individual, that is the main part, getting them off the street, but also making the greater Atlanta community better off because of those results. Is that it, Ms. Winslow? All right. I believe uh, if Ms. Winslow is finished, we have one other person to speak. That's Mr. Bond. Mr. No, Bond. I'm, no, I'm not done. Hold on, hold on. Uh, oh, I, I was on mute. I, I, I had myself on mute. So let me say this real quickly, because I want to say this for the public. You know, the state, has 
uh, this past session almost $91.2 million was cut from the budget to really help the people that we're talking about. $91 million. 91, I have to say it again, $91 million was taken from the state or the state just said, okay, we're done. So all of that flows down to the city. And so we're doing the best that we can with the resources. And I appreciate everybody that's doing what they're doing. Um, you know, and I would hope that when people see people running down the street naked, don't call the city, call your state person and ask them why $91.2 million was taken out of behavioral uh, disabilities and whatever the name of that department is, okay, to balance the budget. Because these are the individuals that we're dealing with. We're dealing with individuals that need 24-7 supervision. We're not dealing with individuals that you can just put into a program, nothing to get you, Judge Porter. We're just not dealing with somebody you can just put in a program. We're dealing with people that need 24-7 supervision. They need to be on their medication. They just have to have people looking after them because that's just where those individuals are that have been released from these programs. So I just want that to be known to the public. Okay, so if you see somebody running down the street naked, okay, call your state person too. I appreciate you calling me, but call your state person because there are other issues that are happening that are falling on not only the city of Atlanta, but other cities throughout the state. Just other cities throughout the state in terms of issues and in terms of problems. So it's not just the city of Atlanta's problem. And so we're doing the best that we can. Uh, and I get frustrated myself, you know, because I want us to do more and do better. But the state has been inundating us for the last 30 years uh, with this issue. So, I, I mean, okay, I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm done, Madam Chair. I, I don't know how we, we can re-engage our state people to to help them understand that th this is not just it's not just about the city it's just about the whole state it's just about everything so okay thank, thank you, you. Well, all right thank you mr bond thank you madam chair and, and thank you uh judges for your presentation my, my question goes back to the uh, first, a couple, couple of issues. One is about race, the street racing cases. I know that uh, I believe APD has arrested over 600 folks over the last few months, and just wanted to know where did those uh, the disposition, the dis, uh, disposition of those cases uh, lie or remain, or if you've got okay. it broken down, if I may. Um uh, this is Deputy Chief Judge Ward. Uh, in that regard, um, uh, I'd ask, uh, you know, that you keep in mind that we opened the doors uh, full time on October 26th. So these cases uh, have, uh, you know, received citations, arrests from March to, uh, you know, prior to, I guess, the weekend prior to October 26th. Uh, we're in a position now where these cases are just coming into the court over the past weeks or so for first settings. Now, uh, as far as this dispositions, I just can give you the general information that you know uh, that uh, city ordinance violations carry a maximum penalty of $1,000 and six months in custody. Uh, and with regard to the misdemeanors, $1,000 fine and uh, 12 months in custody. Um, so those are the dispositions. They have not been broken down as of yet. And uh, a lot of the dispositions, uh, if you will, the adjudications have not been had in these cases, if you will, because they uh, have come in for the first setting. Uh, and so if we're averaging about 300 cases per week, uh, a nominal amount of those cases are being uh, 
resolved. Uh, not many at all. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, as of last week, uh, I started seeing uh, resets after the first setting um, for status to hire an attorney and so forth. So we're in the process at this time. And, uh, you know, they, this process or these cases are subject to effective case flow management. Uh, so I can assure you that, uh, you know, we're going to handle them. And I know your question is more to dispositions, but we can provide that information as these cases make it through uh, the courtroom. Oh, no, that was a, a – that you, you answered what I was uh, trying to get at. And I'd just like to ask by, the, by your next uh, presentation if you all could break those dispositions or a kind of uh, bifurcate that from uh, what else might be going on in the court just so we can have an idea of how effective uh, our adopting Judge Portis's uh, – Board order was or not. I, I think it's been doing good, and I, I think the trend of street racing overall is going down. But just want to have a good idea of how uh, the cases are being handled, including um, the adjustments we made for people who are on the ATVs. And uh, I believe there was we did something on spectators. Uh, Mr. Hillis, we did something on spectators uh, this past summer. And I guess my next question, it kind of gets back to what uh, Ms. Winslow is saying. <clears throat> and I, I've heard that uh, the bond program at the jail, that there have been a lot of repeat offenders that have come to the jail, that the idea was that, you know, once you violated or failed to appear in court, that you wouldn't be uh allow the you know allow the privilege of signing yourself out again have, have you all seen uh well i guess what is the status of those who have signed their own bond do you have any statistics on that or are people actually showing up to court or what, what's going on because I, I heard some talk on talk radio about it and i just just wanted to know for myself uh well in in general uh we know that um, the self bond, uh, coupled with the lack of an address, um, is a three out of four times more likely to, to not reappear. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, there is always the real need to make sure that, uh, you're taking a look at what's going on with the individual because someone who bona fide has absolutely no resources whatsoever at all is going to need a method, a means to be released pretrial um, without having to post something, no matter the number of offenses, um, especially for minor offenses, because they simply don't have uh, the resources. Uh, so that is one of the things that the homeless court um, allows us the opportunity to do. Um, it is to require the participation uh, in something that is not punitive, but at least rehabilitative to the sense that it's going to get someone connected with resources and that that is a requirement to uh, release. Uh, we have not been seeing as many of those individuals over the past months uh, partially because of the changing trend to not engage those folks with the criminal justice system, but to utilize alternative means to interact with them on the front end of whatever is going on. Um, but we do still see a handful of those folks, and as we see them, um, a part of the bond scenario now uh, involves at the very least evaluation through the homeless court and in many instances actually enrolling um, as a part of the uh, management and accountability to ensure participation with with coming back to court. Also, a big component of it of the homeless court is all of your open city of Atlanta cases uh, will be resolved upon your completion of whatever it is that is established as your 
uh, plan while you're in the program. Uh, but again, I, I do at least caveat that with uh, we have seen a substantial decrease uh, in those individuals even coming into um, into the system. Uh, so in some respects, there is uh, the missed opportunity because some of the complaints that we at least hear uh, from some of the uh, at least residents downtown is that no one is hearing their side of the story from the standpoint of uh, some of the behavioral issues that they are experiencing. So, uh, you know, we are in the justice and fairness business and trying to balance the realities of, of all of these things, of the individual as well as the greater society. And, and the same is true uh, even for your first question on the street race. And as you know and fully understand, uh, you know, this isn't a, a hang them high operation. Uh, we want to make sure that individuals, regardless of what's going on in the public and what they're charged with, uh, know that this is an institution inside the city of Atlanta that you will be given all of your rights and process that's afforded to you. And just like any place else in this country that you will be presumed to be innocent, um, our responsibility is to make sure that there is process in place to move those through the system efficiently. And that is one of the reasons why uh, I wanted to bring Judge Ward forward this afternoon to make sure that this body knew that, to your point, uh, this will be something that you will be able to actually see and track information on to see how well it's going, but also hear from the judge that is hearing those cases to the extent that he can comment at least on court procedure to know exactly what's going on when it goes on. Well, thank you for that, Chief Judge. And just a quick follow-up. Prior to our enacting the quote-unquote bail reform, uh, there was you know, a pretrial release uh, program that was going on in our city jail. People seem to forget that, that allowed people to sign their own bond. But those individuals were officers of the court and like now where the province of release is with the chief of corrections or his his designee would it be helpful to the uh homeless court if we returned the pre the, the authority not change people's ability to sign their own bond i don't want people to think i'm going there i'm not but just changing the who administers uh, that authority back to pretrial release officers so that they could be in offices of the court that they might have better dips or could track or keep keep up with the individuals who are due in court once they sign their own bond. Would it be helpful to return that administration back to the court or does it matter? Well, obviously on the on the court side, we have the ability, for instance, to view uh and an entire gcic record as a part of not just the bond determination but the pre-trial portion of what needs to happen before someone is just uh is exited out uh, also as i've said in the past the the first appearance portion gives the court the ability to take a look at individuals as well as individual circumstances and cases and determine whether or not there are there is the need for special conditions um, of bond. So, you know, in the one hand, you know, an individual could be a repeat offender. In the other hand, if someone has gone and done an act, even a minor act of violence at a particular location, a part of the pretrial release could still find them signature bond eligible but also attach as a special condition of, of bond the requirement that they stay away from that location. And of course, if they come back in short order and they have been back at that location and have violated the condition of bond, then there is a different conversation that's had about uh, whether or not they need to sit it out uh, from the public for a period of time, whether that's 24, 48 or 72 hours so that everyone can make sure that the best thing possible for the individual and the community occurs. Uh, so, of course, there, there, is, there are different opportunities uh, and focus points at, at, at 
both sides of that coin. Uh, I think that one of the things that predicated the signature bond ordinance was one, uh, some of the information about how long individuals were being held, uh, but then two, uh, the lack of the opportunity at least to hear from I guess the court system on exactly how some of these mechanics actually work together, uh, even though um, the story around them seemed to be draconian and punitive. Um, but, you know, council member, I, I can tell you that there are mechanisms that uh, make it very practical to have those pretrial release officers there, to have the records in front of you, uh, to be able to make a fully informed uh, decision and have that decision made by a judicial officer, uh, which is required by uh, state law. Uh, it, there are some very practical reasons as to why uh, that is a good idea. Uh, the question of should that be the case, the good news for me is I can't be ethically in the policymaking business. It's two weeks from Christmas, so I'm going to stay on the uh, – not naughty list and uh, stay out of that one. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk to some authority on on uh, offline about that because it it would seem to be a common sense thing for me that if you're going to end up in that court anyway, uh, why not just have the court officers there at the beginning? You know, right? So that's right. Well. Yeah, you know, I, I tend to I tend to believe that uh, you know policy gets made, and there's no reason to stop there. We're always at an opportunity junction to continue to make the system better. Uh, so I am, you know, here to be a participant with you, to and this body to make sure that uh, we continue to advance the city of Atlanta's mission and goal uh, of criminal justice reform, but to also do it in a way that continues to impact the city in a, in a positive way and, and to do that so that uh, we are the, the example of it. So uh, let me know what information I can provide, and if I can provide it, you always have a partner in me. All right. Thank you very much. And Madam Chair, I, I yield. All right. Mr. Bond, I'll be interested in working with you on that, so let's talk later, okay? Okay, great. All right. All right. So, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, I don't, I don't, unless somebody else has questions, uh, we're going to move back on. I got to go back to Chief, uh, Assistant Chief Court for a moment to answer a couple more questions and then we're going to move on. Thank you, Judge Portis and Judge Ward for being here today. If I don't talk to you before the holidays, happy, happy holidays. Thank you. Happy, happy holidays. holidays to you too. As well, happy holidays to everyone. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Chief Court, are you back on the phone? Can we allow him to be unmuted for a moment? There are a couple of questions that I failed to uh, follow through with that I need to have answered. And then we're going to move quickly as we can to the next couple of things. Yes, ma'am. I, I am back on. So, Chief Court, one in particular is uh, people are still asking. We've had a long, deep conversation at our last committee meeting about 911. So people are still wanting to get information on that. I know Mr. Brown is on the call, and he's saying he's getting a lot of folks asking about 911. And the last thing is what happened this past weekend with the uh, protest that was downtown. So if you could answer those questions, I would that would help me greatly. Thank you. Okay, as far as 911, um, for some reason this weekend we had a um, an increase in the number of calls. We don't know why. Uh, at this point, we don't believe it was associated with the uh, protest that happened this weekend, but we did receive an increased number of calls. We, we are aware that there was an extended um, response time or hold time for that, um, and that is attributed to the shortage uh, of personnel that was at 911. So uh, that is something that we are still continuing to try and address and, and make some changes in our staffing and our hours to make sure that we um, re respond or answer the calls in, in a proper amount of time. Um, what specifically, what, what specific questions um, 
did council member brown have about the protest no that wasn't from him that was from uh myself so but let's just oh, go back to the 911 let's go back to the 911 scenario again uh i think there was another proper question i'm gonna i'm gonna read for you the question she had so one was uh, what's the potential crime happening with residents that actually live in atlanta versus outside of atlanta that's one of his questions and then he had another question and he also talked about a heat map he wants a heat map for major crimes from where they're occurring provide to councils by zip codes and zones and i asked for that before also and i really my goal is by first of the year by next by committee meeting Ms. linda write this down we have to have that that heat map serious business because i've been asking for it and i wanted to break down by zip codes i've asked that several times so we need need help with that but can you go back to the percentage of crime tapping the resident the percentage of crime happening living in atlanta versus outside atlanta i don't know if you have a percentage to know that i mean you keep trying to do a comparison of percentage of crime happening in atlanta versus outside atlanta do you have any of that type of data no ma'am we, we don't track that data as far as uh the people the vic i guess you're asking the victims of crime whether or not they stay in the city or you know, have a residence outside the city we, we don't have a at this point i don't have the numbers um how that is broken down okay maybe you can give that i don't know if you can help if you have time to get that but if you can help us with that and then the other thing he's asking is the heat map of major crimes and where they are occurring provide the council by zip codes and zones i think that would be very insightful and i really need that map. so i'm asking by our next committee meeting in the first of the year that we would need to have that Okay, a heat map broken down by this Okay. Mm-hmm. And by zone. And by zone. And by zone. Yes, okay. ma'am. I repeat it. I'm sorry, you distorted. What did you say? No, I was just repeating you. You want a heat map broken down by system and by zone. Right. Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Coy before we let him? I'm going to really let him go this time. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Chief Coy. You're welcome. You've done a great All job, Chief right. Coy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Happy holidays. You too. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. Now we're going to move on to our last presentation, which is the Atlanta Citizens Review Board. And we're having Mr. Reed, the executive director of the ACID, to come before us. Mr. Reed, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair Shepherd. Excuse me. Madam Chair Shepherd and Public Safety Committee members, Atlanta, Atlanta City Council, and Mayor Bottoms and her administration team for the support that's been provided thus far. I'd like to also thank the citizens of Atlanta for their support and trust in the ACLB board and staff for their unwavering commitment as we can continue to navigate the many challenges that have faced us this year. I wanted to get that out front um, to really get a thank yous because this has been a uh, interesting year for everyone. On the line with me today are Myla Smith, Project Manager, and Sheena Robertson, Investigations Manager. We can go to slide two. Um, for those citizens who may not be familiar, the ACRB was created in 2007 after Ms. Catherine Johnson's death by Atlanta police officers during an illegal raid. Uh, the agency opens its doors in 2008, and since that time, the agency has received its most impressive support this year. While the picture on the side only captures a slice of the staff and board members doing a training exercise with the APD, it represents the diversity and commitment of many citizen board members and the staff over the years. These dedicated, experienced individuals bring their knowledge, passion, and integrity to every action and function associated with the ACRB. The board is led by Ms. Cecilia Houston-Torres and supported by amazing staff. 
On the next slide, slide three, the complaint data for the years as follows. To your right, you'll see a chart that shows a downward trend. Um, so you'll notice the impact of COVID is recognized in our numbers. The number of complaints received is approximately half of what we would normally receive. Despite not meeting for five months, the board and staff dug deep and managed to have seven board meetings in the last five months, adjudicating 49 complaints investigations for the year and eliminating a backlog of cases that had developed from March through August we were not able to meet. On slide four, while, while all activity was basically stopped for months, we figured out how we would proceed with serving the needs of the community and APD. The investigative team led by Machine and Robertson collaborated with the APD Office of Professional Standards and develop the process for virtual interviews to allow for officer interviews to continue, stopping the, the delay of the investigations. Despite the delay of investigations, the team managed to keep investigations below 180 days and will continue to get towards the number of below 120 days for investigation. We'll go to the next slide, slide five. On this slide, you're going to see a big green arrow and an 81% decided. This percentage represents the APD's rate of agreement on ACRB sustained allegation. Those decisions represent 62% of sustained allegations that the agency sent to the APD during the year. I just want to stop right here for a moment just to, so we can take that in. 81% is unheard of for a police department to agree with any civilian oversight agency during any evaluation period or anything. This is an encouragement of what can happen. However, below that, we do see the yellow tri triangle, which says caution, because there's still 38% of the same allegations awaiting the chief's decision. But for this slide, for this moment, I want to, I want to talk about the 81%. I definitely want to see more of it. And now, if we could move on to slide, the community outreach slide on slide six. Despite COVID, we're constantly working to develop ways to remain engaged with the citizens of Atlanta. The ACRB outreach team led by Melinda Smith has been working hard to make sure that the ACRB remains visible during the pandemic. We engage in more mass media advertising this year than ever before. And this is due to the increased funding provided during FY21 to address the citizens' concerns about the ACRB's existence and the city council and the mayor's making ACRB outreach a priority issue to be resolved. And we appreciate that support. On slide seven, there's a sampling of billboard locations that we have used recently. We currently have more billboards going up in a couple of weeks. We also have martyr bus stands as coming in a few weeks as well. Uh, next slide on slide eight. We've also been using the TV to inform citizens of the ACRB. We have been fortunate to have locally known individuals and youth to provide public service announcements, announcements for our TV bots. And on the next slide, you'll see on slide nine, we really increased our social media. And we'll go to slide 10, which, which also has our social media stats. We're building our social media presence over the past <clears throat> several months. Because of COVID, we've had to adjust our outreach strategy and place more emphasis on engaging the public in a responsible, informative manner through social media. The statutes see reflect the work since June 2020. As I've been learning, building awareness through social media has worked, and for us it has to be interesting, yet balanced, and thoughtful. We can go to slide 11. Since our last presentation, the ACRB completed its art and essay contest, established its content writers club, 
made presentations and participated in panel discussions and webinar series. This past Friday, the staff put out an excellent virtual recognition for the winners of the 2020 Arts and Essay Contest. We have seven winners from the City of Atlanta contest and six winners for the Special Open Entry Contest. As always, the contest focused on increasing the conversation around improving relationships between citizens and officers. The theme this year was, if I could change law enforcement, it would look like this. We could go to slide 12. On slide 12, the ACR is working. This slide talks about the, uh, the mayor's administrative orders. We've been working with the mayor's administration and the APD to achieve directives of the mayor's administrative orders. As you see from the slide, there are seven actions that the ACRB and APD are developing or currently underway. So much has happened over the years, and, to, and so much needs to be still accomplished in this window of opportunity that has a full-time job in itself to meet the challenges that have come before the ACRB, before the ACRB since March. As the agency, we welcome the changes and challenges and commit to the work passionately and thoughtfully because we believe this opportunity cannot be squandered. We go to slide 13. Along with the work of the administrative orders, the agency has been working on collaborations with Mercy University and Dr. Magunga Akiniela. We are excited about these collaborations because they present the opportunity to move the needle on what civilian oversight can do. Our collaboration with Mercy University will include digitizing ACRB messaging and materials using the state social and emotional standards for the schools and creating programs that we meet the needs of schools, that we meet the needs of the schools. Our plan is to work with APS, charter schools, and private middle schools and after school programs to provide this information with the school's lesson plans where appropriate. Our collaboration with Dr. Akinella is innovative in that we're taking a time-tested clinical therapist-led support group method to assist community members with dealing with, dealing with trauma associated with officer misconduct. I would like to have shown you a clip from California that explains why this is necessary, but I'll give you the highlights of it. During the interview with the man who was stopped by police, he said that I've never been experienced, I've never experienced anything like this. I never had a gun in my face. I was just a black man trying to get home from work. I don't think I'll ever get over it. Having done this work for many years, I know many community members who experienced, witnessed, or just been exposed through living in the communities or the news media, that feeling of, I don't think I'll ever get over it. This new project that we're embarking, this Project Safe Space, is a new ACRB initiative geared towards helping community members share, support, and learn tools to cope as they work towards dealing with the trauma associated with officer of misconduct. So we can move forward to slide 14. Along with the items I mentioned in the previous slides, we have several items that we're currently work and currently working on in various stages. The hiring of three positions, implementing community work for board, committee work for board, resuming training for board, finalizing collabor collaborations, developing and implementing a new case management system. Ordinance cleanup, bylaws updates, and filling the youth organization board seats. So on our last, on our next to last slide, slide 15, I want to start back. I want to continue where I left off at with the thank yous. Over the last three months and beyond for some, I want to say thank you again to the board and staff. Thank you to the citizens of Atlanta, Mayor Bottoms, and her administration. Council President Felicia Moore, full Atlanta City Council, Council Member Julian Bond, Council Member Andre Dickens, 
Council Member Joy Shepard, the members of the Content Writers Club, Ministries of Force Task Force, Megan Transition Inc., Mary Parker Foundation, Urban League of Greater Atlanta, Mercer University, Dr. Makunga Akinyeli, Motivo, and Judge David Hort retired. I'll conclude with my presentation with slide 16 with our contact information. ACRB can be reached at 404-865-8622, or you can visit us on the web at acrbgov.org. With that, I'll conclude my presentation and accept any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Well, Mr. Reed, I just want to say that it's been a long year. We started off, you know, in terms of who we are in the city, and we this has been 2020 has been a year, but it really has helped us tremendously to appreciate ACRB and what they bring to the table and to really support you all better in terms of what you bring. I'm looking for your report and looking at some of the things we talked about as we increase your budget that you're working on. Uh, I see the mass media billboards that are across the city and all the stuff that people are doing and hiring these people. I'm hoping as we roll into 2021 that we can have much more, see you more, be much more entrenched out there as we get over COVID-19 and we can really be out there on the street. But thank you for what you all bring to the city. Look forward to working with you next year. Uh, and also in terms of reimagining the police department and all the other things that you do. Thank you for your support for everything you do. Thank you. All right. We are now, we'll move on on our agenda. Uh, Ms. Lindo, this a young lady from uh, communications, did she have a plug in? Yes, Madam Chair, she actually called and said that she had an emergency and was not able to participate today and would like to table that until our next meeting. Okay, so when we get to communications again, we'll do a, 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 a motion to hold, okay? That's correct, yes. Let's just continue to move forward. We're now at our consent agenda and we will actually look at uh, resolution claims with favorable and unfavorable recommendations uh, we have two uh, that are before us that's favorable. Uh, items one and two. Is there a motion to accept those two? I'll make the motion. Anybody want to second it? Second, Winslow. All right. A motion and a second by Ms. Winslow. Motion by me, second by Ms. Winslow. Ms. Lindell, we're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, are you in? Yes, I'm in the system now. Okay, I thought I, I saw you. All right. Mr. Sanoki, are you back? He had to leave for a moment. I'm not sure if he's back yet. I'm back. I'm trying to sign back in. And it looks like I'm about, I just voted online. We're good to go. Yes, right. Madam Chair, that's seven, yay, zero, nays. Those items are favorable. All right, thank you. We're now to move the claims with unfavorable recommendations. Um, those are items three through 44. Uh, motion is to approve. Is there a second? Winslow, second. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. Ms. Lindo, we're ready for the vote. One moment, Madam Chair. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. Those items have been adverse. I'm sorry. Okay. So we're now at items for first read. And I think we have two items for first read. I'll make a motion to accept those in the sec as first read. Is there Madam a second? Chair, I just have to read them into the record. There's no okay. votes needed. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Go ahead and read them in. First, first item is 20-0-1788. This is an ordinance by the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee amending the fiscal year 2021 intergovernmental ground fund budget 
and Department of Police by adding to anticipations and appropriations the amount of $425,320 for the 2020 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant from the United States Department of Justice and for other purposes. Item number two was 20-0-1789, different ordinance by the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee, amending the fiscal year 2021 intergovernmental grant fund budget in the Department of Police by adding two stations and appropriations, the amount of $196,881.60 for the 2020 Highway Enforcement of Aggressive Traffic Grant from Governor's Office of Highway Safety and for other purposes. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We will now move to our regular agenda. We have this one item uh, up on the communications. You want to read that in and we can make a motion. Well, you've already read it. You want to make a motion to hold? We'll just, I'll make the motion to hold. One moment, Madam Chair. Second by one slow. All right. Just for the record, Madam Chair, that will be 20C0146. All right. There's a motion and a second. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Seven years, zero nine. That I am is held. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We've already gone to the other one on the communications. Now we're at ordinance for second read. Can you read the, the item number one, Ms. Lindo? Yes. Madam Chair, that's Ordinance 20 1697. This is an amended ordinance by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee to amend Chapter 30, Article 23 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, vending in the public right of way, public property vending, in order to remove kiosks from the public property vending program and for other purposes. And I believe it's come back, but we're going to be asking asked to be held. They're still working on this piece of legislation. Commissioner King called me and asked if we could hold it until the first of the year. So the motion is to hold. Second. Thank you, Mr. Bond. So we're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In favor. All right, thank you. This vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. That item has been held. All right, we're now at item number two. Could you sound that, Ms. Lindo? Ms. Montero, that's Ordinance 20 1751. This is an ordinance by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee in accordance with Section 2-1163C, Article 10 of the Procurement and Real Estate Code to ratify contract FC-7522 Pharmacy Services with Correct Pharmacy Services, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Corrections and exercise renewal number one for a term of one year retroactively effective from May 13, 2020 through May 12, 2021 in an amount not to exceed $350,000. All funds shall be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. The administration has asked us to hold this thing would like for this to be held. So there's a motion to hold. Is there a second? By Winslow. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. Ms. Lindo, we're ready for the vote. Vote is held, Ms. Linda? Yes, seven years, zero days, that item is held. All right, thank you. We're now moving to item number three, um, and I believe this is going to be held also. Would you, would you go ahead and sound it, Ms. Linda? Yes, Madam Chair, that's Ordinance 20, that's 1752. This is an ordinance by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or designee in accordance with Section 2-1163C, Article 10 of the Procurement and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta, Code of Ordinances to ratify contract FC-7522, 
7175 Inmate Dental Services with Quality Plan Administrators, Inc. on behalf of the Department of Corrections and exercise renewal number one for a term of one year retroactively effective from June 4th, 2020 through June 3rd, 2021 in an amount not to exceed $130,671.96. All contracted work to be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. The motion is to hold. Is there a second? Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? Is it, can you give us a second? I can. Okay, go ahead. Ms. Smith, is that you? Yes, it is. Sorry. But I didn't want to jump in at the wrong place. I just easier if she does it. I know, but we don't seem to. She must be on mute. We can't get off mute. So we're going to move forward. So there's a motion and a second. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Ms. Winslow, if you're there, please let us know. All right. That is closed. Six zero zero and eight. Madam Chair, that item is closed. Okay. We're now on item number four, and I believe we have an amendment. Is that correct? That's, that's correct, Madam Chair. We're and the amendment will the add. The amendment will add the um, accounting numbers within the uh, legislation. Motion to bring the amendment forward. Is there a second? Second, one slow. Ah, you're back. Okay. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. We're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. <laughs> the vote is closed, 7 years, 0 and 8. This item has been amending, and that's Ordinance 20-0-1753. An, an amended ordinance by the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims involving the City of Atlanta in the matter of City of Atlanta versus Friends My Family Corporation in the Fulton County Superior Court, civil action file number listed herein, in settlement of the condemnation of 104 acres of required right of way and and one and 17,500.13 square feet of temporary easement for the Martin Luther King Jr. Innovative Corridor Project located at 2194 Martin Luther King Jr. Drive in Land Landlot 180 of District 14 of Fulton County, Georgia. All amounts, all amounts associated with these actions shall be charged to and paid from accounts listed herein and for other purposes. All right, thank you. Motion to accept as amended. Is there a second? Yes, it was. All right. And right after he was a close second. <laughs> All right, we'll take yours. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed, 7 yay, 0 nay. This item is favorable as amended. All right, thank you, Ms. Lindell. We'll now move to item number five. That's, Madam Chair, that's Ordinance 20 1766. It's an ordinance by Council Member Amir Faroki amending Chapter 162. Article 5, Vehicle Immobilization Services, Section 162-261, signed so as to clarify the minimum requirements of uniform and adequate signage to be posted on private property whereon vehicle immobilization services are to be employed and for other purposes. 
And this is Mr. Ferrofi's taker. Mr. Ferrofi, would you want to come forward, please, and just kind of talk to us about both of this with us, please? Yes, I'm happy to, Madam Chair. This is just simply a um, a small uh, edit to the to make sure that the language in our um, booting ordinance matches uh, what the signage um, template and requirement is right now that's held out by APD. So it just it aligns everything. So there's no confusion. There's no change in in policy or um, or guidelines for for booting. It simply cleans up some some language discrepancy. And I move to approve. All right. Is there a second? Second. Oh. All right. Any questions from anyone? If not, we're ready for the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed, 78 0 and 8. That item is favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Uh, we're now at item number six. Uh, can we sound, is that amended also? Is there some No, Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay. And we can take item number six and seven as a block. They're both amending um, chapter uh, 10 of the, the code. Okay. All right. Well, let's do Item number. Item number six, 2007-1776. This is an ordinance by Council Member Jennifer and I to amend Chapter 10, Article 2, Section 10-92B of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances so as to provide an exemption from the distance requirements listed in Section 10-88.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for one package store licensed to sell malt beverages and or wine by the package located at two 2233 Faulkner Road, Northeast Atlanta, and for other purposes. Item number seven, that's 20 1777. This is ordinance by Council Member Jennifer and I to amend Chapter 10, Article 2, Section 1092B of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances so as to provide an exemption from the distance requirements listed in Section 10 88.1 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for one specialty food shop licensed to sell malt beverages and or wine by the package located at 1019 Virginia Avenue at Northeast Atlanta and for other purposes. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. Move 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 we're ready for the vote, Ms. Lindo. The vote is open, Madam Chair. The vote is closed, seven years, zero and eight. Those items are favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're now down to our resolution, and we have two items, uh, eight and nine. I believe we can take those as a block also. So let's read those in, Ms. Lindo. Yes, Madam Chair. Item number eight, it's 20R4746. This is a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendants in the case of Chelsea DeLucio versus the City of Atlanta, civil action number listed herein, pending in the state of, of pending in the state court of Fulton County, Georgia, in the amount of $30,000 the settlement amount and authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. Item number 9, 20R, 4747. This is a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the defendant in the case of Clay Rose versus City of Atlanta civil file action listed herein in the amount of $330,000 authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein, and authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. Wind flow of both items. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. I'll second. And we're ready for the vote. 
about this often? The vote is closed. Seven yeays, zero nays. Both items are favorable. Thank you, Ms. Lindo. We're now down to held papers. Is there anything up under papers that are held that's coming off, Ms. Lindo? No, Madam Chair. All right. And Madam, I think Chair, people Madam, are... Madam Chair, I did yeah, receive an email from um, um, the administration regarding the corrections paper. And they have indicated that just the dental paper was to be held and not the pharmacy services. So they would like to ask the uh, committee if they would move forward on that. Wait, wait, so what, I'm sorry, did, did we do that wrong? So help me, help me with this. Maybe I'm yes, there were two. Yeah, there were two contracts. One was for dental services, which was uh, 20 1752 and that is the paper they would like held. And then it's item number two, which is 2017-51, which is pharmacy services. And they would like that paper to be considered by the committee. So number two, the one we put on hold, we're gonna go back. And, and that's not, not the one to be held. And then what is the one to be held again? That is 2017-52, which is for dental services. No, and we've already approved that. Did we approve that? We no. held both, but they only wanted one to be held, okay, okay. the dental services. Okay, so we need to go back. So the motion is to reconsider item number two. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm making that motion. Is there a second? Second, Smith. All right, there's a motion and a second to reconsider. We're ready for the vote. The vote is open. Thank you. Ms. Winslow, how do you vote? In, fa in favor. All right. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. This item has been, is on the floor. Are we now will make a motion to approve that item 20-0-1751. Is there a second? Winslow. Thank you, Ms. Winslow. The vote is open, Madam Chair. Thank you. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, zero nays. That item is, is favorable. Thank you. And that's it, right? That's correct, Madam Chair. Okay. All right, well now we're at papers that are held. Is there any papers that are coming off of hell? Not to my knowledge, Madam Chair. All right. All right, we're now at the very end of the year. Yay, yay. Yay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I want to thank uh, all of my colleagues on the committee. I think we, we did pretty good this year. I'm very proud of you all and everything we've accomplished. It has been a long year with a lot of things that's been going on. Just think about from the beginning, uh, all things going on in terms of the protests, uh, defunding the police, ACDC. We've just had a lot of things that we have went through this year. And I'm very proud of where we've come at this point. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do in 2021. Um, Ms. Lindo is sending out a list of things that we did this year. And I want y'all to re read it. We're not going to talk about that today. I want y'all to read over what she's sending out. When we will come back the 1st of January, we will talk about this list and what we want to see accomplished for 2021. So that's where we are at this point. Ms. Lindo, did I leave anything else? Congratulations. Yeah, I think you covered uh, it all. Yeah. Uh, the president uh, well, just wants to say good job to you, Madam Chair, and all the members of the committee. You all have did some heavy, heavy lifting, and uh, you probably still have more to do next year, but thank you all for your hard work. I appreciate it. And so do the citizens of Atlanta. Thank you, President Moore. Ms. Smith. 
I think you had your hand raised, Ms. Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say too that our chair has been really good. You've done, you've gone, we've had such an unprecedented, strange year. We've had, um, we've had to get used to running these remote meetings and you've done a great job with that. I just want to say, and I'm really excited that you're going to be our chair again next year. So thank you. And it was refreshing to hear Ms. Moore say it too. Thank you. Good job. Mr. And I'll make the motion to adjourn. No, no, we got a couple more people who want to speak. Mr. Bond. I think we got at least one more. Mr. Bond. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to echo everything that everyone has said. It's been a pleasure to serve on this committee. And uh, we have done a lot of, we've had a lot of challenges this year. And I believe that your leadership was uh, phenomenal uh, given the challenges that we've experienced, not just sitting in on the committee, but outside of the I don't want to say outside the purview, but out, outside of the, the timing of the meeting, uh, you demonstrated uh, a lot of leadership in the public safety realm. So it's a pleasure to serve with you. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not uh, wish my son Skylar a happy birthday today. He's 31 years old as of 1.51 p.m. I was watching all my children when he was born in the hospital. So happy birthday. Wow. Wow, that that is unbelievable, Michael. Only you can always come back and be on point. That's great. I want to wish my mother a happy birthday. Her birthday is today too. She's 88 years old. We celebrated a big, beautiful day with her yesterday, and she's at home resting today. But happy birthday, mom! So thank you. So now, unless we have anybody else, Miss Smith, we'll take your motion to. A Thank Hello, you, Madam, Chair. Madam Chair. You know, this is Councilmember Winslow. You know, all my years, this has been the most challenge. You know, over the last year, and you have stepped up. You stepped out. You've done a tremendous job. And like Councilmember, I just want, you know, I just want to say thank you because you've really done a phenomenal job. Thank you. We appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate all of you all also. I really do. I said, you know, you all, we are, if you're a team here, we're all a team. It's all about us being a team. So, so thank you all for that. And Ms. Moore, thank you for giving my team back to me. <laughs> yeah, all right. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks. much. If I, if I don't talk to you up over the holidays, I just want to wish y'all a happy holiday. Have let's make go out this year. Try to enjoy yourself. We're gonna be on recess after this week. Uh, have a great holiday, happy New Year's, and just enjoy. And I'm out there and to the audience, same thing to y'all out, out there in our listening land. Also, happy holidays, everyone. We're gonna keep on working, going forth next year. Thank and you, Mara. Continue to mask up. Exactly. Yeah. COVID nineteen is real. Mask up and go vote. Please go vote. Today is the first day of early vote. Yeah, you're right. Started today. Thank you. Yes. All right. All right. Motion to adjourn. Y'all have a great one. Happy New Year's. Happy holidays. Happy New Year's.